Good morning. My apologies for a little bit of a delay this morning. <clears throat> We're calling to order Commission meeting number 280 of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission on Thursday, October 24th, 2019 at 10 a.m. here in our offices at 101 Federal Street in Boston. We will start with agenda item number two regarding our minutes. Commissioner Stebbins. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioners, you have in your packet the meeting minutes from the October 10th, 2019 meeting. I would move their approval, again, subject, as always, to any typographical errors or any other non-material matters. Are there any comments or edits? Second. Uh, <clears throat> Second. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien, do you have any? Uh, I do have a couple uh, questions mm -hmm. um, and appreciate Commissioner Cameron's second, but I did want the record to reflect, if um, you wouldn't mind, Char, on page six to reflect that we acknowledged uh, Commissioner Cameron's uh, service um, as chairing the Public uh, Safety Committee. So that would be on page six. And the only other question I had is, and it, it may be exactly right, but that's why I turn to you, Commissioner O'Brien, on page five, does the next to the last paragraph, does that seem to you to be in proper order? Yes. Okay, good. All right, then I'm all set, thank you. Okay, we can make that addition to reflect your, your notes, okay. Madam Chair. So your motion would be uh, reflecting just that amendment. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0. Thank you. And next on the agenda, uh, we had anticipated our uh, presentation on the research and responsible gaming under uh, Director Vanderlinden, but I believe it's just a delay on our presenters. So we will, in the interest of time, continue with the administrative update from uh, Executive Director Petrosian. Thank sure. you. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. I feel like I should open War and Peace and start reading to keep going. But having said that, um, I have a short administrative update, and I think you all are aware of this, that for our Encore licensee, Mr. DeSalvio has moved on. Um, from staff's position, we would like to thank Mr. Salvio formally um, for his work on behalf of um, Win slash Encore. Um, we found Mr. Salvio to be um, a person who stood by the commitments that were important, helped um, enforce the commitments, um, but was a, a fair advocate for his organization. Um, and uh, I would say that he and I had a number of spirited conversations, um, but they were fair, and he was always fair to deal with. So um, we understand that he will move on to, to the next phase of his life, and, and just on staff level, we thank him for all the contributions. Um, having said that, we do look forward to working with Mr. Gulbrands in the future. So I just wanted to acknowledge that for our record. Um, and, um, and that's really the extent of the administrative update. Thank you. Um, if I could just add to that, I was uh, just recently um, reading the, an article on, um, on Anchor on the Global Gaming Business um, Journal that, that, that we get, and there was um, a really good um, wrap-up uh, view of the whole development arc of the project, which included a feature on Mr. DeSalvio um, at the leadership of that effort. And I think that really captures, in addition to what you said, uh, Ed, captures uh, all the efforts that he undertook and uh, were not, um, were very, uh, very large. And, and it's, it's, it's really hard to uh, develop a property of this side and, and bring it on, on, on time. So um, I think, as you say, um, he was a great um, leader, and uh, we look forward to working with uh, Mr. Goldberts. The company has a deep bench, and, and we expect they will continue with the same approach. 
Thank you. Any anything further? That's all. Thank you. Uh, the only thing that we would add is there has been a change just on the agenda. We will not um, uh, move forward on number seven today. So the only thing, and I was just reminded, Chair, of on this is that Mr. O'Toole may come, Mr. O'Toole from from Penn, if if he does, and if it is helpful to get more of an oral explanation from him, we can do that. If not, we are also anticipating, and thank you, this is a good segue, we anticipate our next meeting may actually be down in, in Plainville mm -hmm. and dealing, not primarily, but um, with a number of horse racing matters. So it would be appropriate to have this, I think, ultimately decided um, down in Plainville at our next meeting, which we expect would be two weeks from today. Right, so the actual vote, we're happy to hear from uh, Mr. O'Toole, but we will sure. not vote on it today. And, and okay, that's right. Excellent. Thank you. Thank, thank you. <coughs> okay. Um, we are proceeding now with then item number uh, five. Good morning, Mr. Ziemba and team. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, today, we're continuing our review of the 2020 mitigation fund guidelines for our next funding round, which begins February 1st of 2020. I'm joined here by Construction Project Oversight Manager Joe Delaney, Director of Workforce Development Jill Griffin, and soon uh, Mary Thurlow, our Community Mitigation Fund Program Manager. So we are uh, continuing our review in an effort to publish our guidelines uh, for the 2020 Mitigation Fund Program by the first week of December. The Commission, as you know, met a couple of weeks ago to review a list of questions to consider uh, in reviewing the fund. We've met with the Local Community Mitigation Advisory Committee in Region A once and the Subcommittee on Community Mitigation. Unfortunately, um, although other meetings have been scheduled with Region B, uh, we've been un unable to meet due to quorum issues. Uh, we have meetings scheduled in November for Regions A and B and the subcommittee, and we're working on finalizing the schedule for the uh, Gaming Policy Advisory Committee meeting. Uh, I'd like to thank all the members of the local community mitigation advisory committees uh, that have provided advice in the format of um, uh, that helped us develop this discussion draft, uh, and they will be very involved when we finalize the guidelines. So uh, what we're trying to do today is to get some consensus just on the discussion draft of the guidelines. That doesn't mean that we're making any final determinations uh, regarding what will be in the guidelines, but it is really a draft to solicit more discussion of items that are outstanding. Uh, this is very similar to what we did last year. Last year we sent the draft out to the public to get comments, and then we reconvened to consider all those comments before we issued the guidelines. So if we can get approval for the discussion draft today, I'd recommend that the Commission put forward this draft for a comment period to end on uh, Monday, November 25th. The goal would be to come back to the Commission on December 5th, the, uh, the, that Commission meeting, so that communities would have roughly two months uh, to put together their applications before the statutory February 1st application deadline. So what we have today in the packet will most likely not be the final guidelines. We'll probably do some wordsmithing even without comments. Uh, what the draft is meant to do is provide you significant detail regarding all the concepts that we are annotating for the 2020 fund. So the first item that I'll give you a brief uh, summary about is whether or not there should be an overall limit uh, for the 2020 fund. Uh, while we recommend an overall limit, we think further dialogue is necessary before we finalize a dollar figure for next year. Uh, we've determined a target budget as of now of $11.5 million based on the revenues that have been put into the fund this year by Encore, Boston Harbor, and MGM Springfield and funds that were unallocated last year. Uh, but we note that we only have data through September. By the time that we revisit the guidelines in December, we'll have more information. As the Commission is aware, we stopped the clock at December 31st for counting revenues uh, that can be used in the following year. Finally, by the time that we review, we review applications in February, 
we will definitely know how much we have available because we do stop that clock as of December 31st of the prior year. Uh, last year in the guidelines, the Commission expressed its intent to allocate funds by region in relation to the monies that are put into the fund from each Category 1 casino. Uh, we recommend that we continue that practice in the upcoming year. This year, out of the proposed $11.5 million target spending amount, uh, we recommend $6 million for spending in Region A, $5 million in Region B, and not more than $500,000 for Category 2 impacts. Again, um, all of these can be waivable, and the Commission does retain the authority to, to adjust those targets as we begin our reviews. Um, as of now, uh, we recommend that the Commission continue with several program types from last year and at the same dollar amounts. Specific impact grants that have been around for a number of years, we recommend the same $500,000 per community. But again, that is, that is waivable and indeed, I think on almost every year we've received a waiver request from at least one of the communities. Uh, but now that the all the Category 1 uh, casinos uh, that have received the license uh, as of this date are operational. The guidelines will allow for grants for operations-related impacts. I'll provide a little bit of an explanation regarding public safety issues in a minute, uh, but let me just get into some of the other types. So um, workforce pilot programs. Uh, we. Uh, recommend an increase in workforce pilot funding from 600000 to 700000 with a 50000 bonus for regional applications. This was a recommendation that was made to the team uh, by the Commission uh, at its last meeting that we try to incentivize greater regional cooperation in all of the workforce grants. Uh, we did include a draft limit on uh, administrative funding at a cap of 7.5%. Uh, Director Griffin's research indicated caps of 5 to 10% in other workforce programs. We do hope to get some comments on the reasonableness of this cap and, and hopefully we can come back with uh, more specific information by the time the Commission reviews this in December. Uh, transportation planning. We don't recommend any changes in this regard. It is the same $200,000 grant. Uh, for transportation planning with a regional bonus just like we had last year. Uh, but we do recommend, unlike last year, that uh, last year for transportation planning and this year in transportation planning, we will only have planning and design and uh, permitting costs, but we have a new category of funding transportation construction. Tribal impact grants, uh, we recommend no changes here. This is the same program from last year, whereby if indeed the tribal facility moves forward, we would have $200,000 available for technical assistance uh, to be administered by the Southeast Regional Planning and Economic Development District. Uh, Non-transportation planning, we recommend an increase here from 50,000 to 100,000. This was a very uh, successful, it has been a very popular program and um, we think that we can get a lot of mileage out of these very small grants. Uh, about 50000 perhaps was a little bit too small, um, and therefore we're recommending a little bit of an increase. Uh, so this year we are recommending um, that we now move forward with transportation construction projects. As you know, this has been an item that's been up for consideration by the Commission and in the Regents for a number of different years. Um, although we're recommending moving forward with transportation construction, we are recommending only one year's worth of grants and that the Commission, at least as of the date of this discussion draft, that we not move forward for multi-year grants. Um, we believe that there's some more work to do uh, in understanding the range of projects. Indeed, we've included a new mechanism so that we can understand projects in the guidelines, which is a, a statement of interests that we would solicit from all parties wanting to do multi-year grants and that statement of interest they wouldn't be a binding uh, matter but we would try to understand the universe of projects that would be uh, seeking multi-year grants so that when we develop the guidelines for next year we'd be better informed uh, in regard to public safety uh, issues the guidelines do recognize that there are multiple sources for public safety um, through host community agreements and also through uh, funds through the Commission. 
uh, but we know that public safety is, is, will likely be, continue to be a priority, but we've included some measures to try to see if we can uh, recognize that there are existing funding resources for public safety. And lastly, I will just mention that we uh, uh, recommend continuing reserves for all those communities that received those in prior years and that those are automatically preserved. <coughs> Um, just a couple of points. Um, just roughly, how many non-transportation planning grants did we get last year, requests and or approvals? Um, just order of magnitude. I mean, I'm, okay, I'm so um, last year, 2019, uh, we granted one, two, three, four, five grants for a total of 1.45 million transportation planning grants. I meant non transportation oh, planning Oh, non transportation grants. planning grants. Well, let me flip the page. I think it was th four, if I'm, if, if I'm correct. Per region or all together? All together. Okay. Could you give an example of one, John? Please. So one of the, one of the uh, innovative transportation, and Mary, can you uh, double check my figures while I'm looking? You have five. Okay, so five instead of four. Um, one, one of the best examples that we received was a request from, uh, from three communities down in the Category 2 region. Foxborough, Wentham, and Plainville for all of the communities to start working together to promote themselves as a re region in relation to the casino. And uh, we thought that that was a pretty innovative approach and it utilized you know, just a very small amount of funding. Um, and that, that's the type of activities we saw. We've also had grants uh, for Revere, Revere and Saugus so that they could put forward videos uh, to promote their communities as greater tourism goes to um, uh, uh, goes to the Encore Casino. The goal is to try to promote the whole region and to, to capture some of those visitors uh, to the region, to our surrounding communities. So we think that these were rather innovative approaches. Thank yeah. you uh, for reminding us. Those are, uh, th and those would receive the $50,000 incentive if they're regionalized. So what we're uh, recommending is that we go from a $50,000 grant 100. to 100000 and, and that there's a regional bonus of ten thousand dollars. Oh, sorry, in it's the ten thousand. Yep. Thank you. But those are good examples of the regional. Yeah, I would I would just add to that, um, John, because you raised the Foxborough application, is that they were also pretty clear that part of their effort is also to support the casino and the jobs and the revenue that we're deriving from it. So it's not only a how can we maximize their presence but at the same time how can we make sure that they remain in a competitive position to again right. offer the employment that they do and in the and hopefully secure the revenues that they provide not only to Plainville but to the Commonwealth so. and um, uh, one other effort from the Commission in that regard in regard to economic development is that we continue to take a look at the gaming economic development fund as a potential resource to communities so that they can do exactly that um, to promote economic development within the regions, which would benefit both the casinos, but then in turn hopefully benefit all of the uh, regional communities because revenues would then come back into the communities through uh, the allocations of the gaming taxes. And um, you know, we've, we put, published a white paper a couple years ago and continue to take a look at the economic development fund as a potential major driver for economic development, but uh, we felt comfortable that we could also have some some funds in the mitigation fund to, to promote that agenda. Well, I, I like the general um, framework uh, in terms of the you know the rough numbers that you uh, outline in the guidelines. Uh, the one the one thing that I that uh, came to mind um, is uh, economic development or the workforce development rather um, guidelines that you have just in terms of relative size, region A you know, has roughly twice as many people, as many, you know, um, employment uh, available uh, as Region B, just, again, just in relative size. And um, if we assume that there will be the same 
percentage of you know rotation or turnover, um, those efforts may, uh, may end up being greater in Region A. Of course, within the guidelines, we have the waivable, uh, and uh, you know, and we in the past funded two uh, of the uh, applications that we that we received in Region A because that was um, a manifested necessity. Um, but I think as we as we move forward. Um, when we do guidelines, we, we need to take into account at least the, the relative um, size of some of these efforts. I think that's a very good point. I just discussed that with Director Griffin. Um, we do have different employment levels at both facilities, and so uh, the employment levels that have sort of a twofold uh, impact. You have both the employees that are working at the facility and then the employees that come from other employers within the communities. And so we may want to take a closer look at um, that maybe the two regions don't have to be exactly balanced given the, the different sizes for the final guidelines. Mm -hmm. One thing that I also mentioned is that um, I think as you just mentioned, Commissioner, last year, even though we're recommending $700,000 this year compared to 600000 that were in the guidelines last year, our overall spending for workforce development was uh, approximately 815000 because we did double up in grants in the Region A region. And so we may want to consider um, what do we do with the overall funding amount. Perhaps it would go up to the 800 level. Perhaps it would be a statewide total where we don't have to balance between the two regions and that we try to make applications uh, within the overall limit. Yeah. So I think that we really should do some hard thinking about that over the next month and a half uh, before yeah. we bring the final guidelines to you. And it could be very well that because the efforts are different, because right. as, you, as you suggest, uh, the unemployment level is relatively different or the, you know, the, the efforts, the other efforts that we don't fund, the community colleges, whatever, they may have different um, needs altogether. Right. Uh, it's, just, it's just a point. I, I, uh, I wanted to also just add uh, talk a little bit about the statement of interest idea. Yes. Uh, I, I think I like it very much. I think it's great to get a sense as to what is that um, potential out there um, to then help us better think of the next guidelines. Right. Um, I would not necessarily limit them to multi-year projects. Um, if, as, as I think you suggested, it, it's good especially to, to know what multi-year needs might be out there. But it's also uh, good to know, in my opinion, as what what may be out there that might be just a one a one year, just just to better help us, you know, determine and plan where possible, um, you know, the amounts that we might be able to make available for the for a subsequent year. I think that's a good point. Um, I didn't go into too much detail about what what is the difference between single year and multi year, and the reason why we're looking making a. a a differentiation between both of those is that we realize that some projects are just going to be so big yep. that there's no way that we could ever fund a sizable proportion of those of those costs in any one year. So we may have to commit, uh, or uh, even if we can't commit, we may want to signal that we could provide funding over multiple years. But if we provide funding for multiple years, you're making a decision in the current year for something that will have lasting impacts for many, many years down the road. And so that's why we're, we're trying to be careful in how we evaluate uh, what, what exists out there for multi-year programs. But your point is uh, that transportation projects in and of themselves can be large, even if you don't need 15 years worth of funding. Mm -hmm. You probably still should take a look at some of the projects, even if it is $1 million or, 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 or a comparable, uh, comparable project. Uh, and this is where the other guideline is, is particularly successful, um, critical rather, and that is you know either matching or not to exceed a certain amount, uh, because you know uh, some of these transportation projects could be quite expensive. Correct. I think that this got mentioned at the last meeting. You you used the term percentage, and I think that you had suggested, Commissioner O'Brien, that it be um, maybe either. A not to exceed number or, or a, a dollar amount rather than a percentage given the variable and size of these projects. Yeah, th uh, that's a good point. Uh, in the guidelines themselves, we did include a recommendation uh, that staff would have the ability to allocate um, funding changes for any one grant 
uh, but consistent with Commissioner O'Brien's uh, recommendation that we would cap that total dollar figure of no more than $10,000. So it, we would have the ability to uh, authorize changes of up to 10% or $10,000, whichever is less in that percentage basis. And we do uh, get changes, uh, unfortunately, rather consistently. I think even since our last meeting, we just got one yesterday, which was uh, unusual. But, uh, but so, we, so we'll have to take a look at that. Uh, in regard to percentages in general, um, there is a gap that we'll be seeking comments on, on what should be the, the cap, the percentage cap, that we would invest in for our transportation construction project. Should we invest no more than 50% or 75% or 25% in the overall costs? Our language says that we uh, want to make sure that we leverage other state, federal, private resources, but we were we, as of now, we still don't have a figure on how much our participation should be, and that's one thing that we'll explore over the next few. And weeks. it could be, maybe flexible, um, if we want to have it a policy, or depending on the nature of the project. Um, yeah. But the cap is, but as long as there's a cap in place, always. Well, there's a cap in place, but again, these are guidelines. So, the, with the whole thing of our guidelines, is we're trying to send a signal to all of the applicants of what we expect that we would fund. But we do always provide the, the flexibility to the commission, if it so chooses, to, to move within a range outside of those guidelines. And so, um, so that's a little bit of the chore because we don't know all of the projects that will find their way to us. And the goal of the statute is that we mitigate those impacts. But we're trying to figure out a way to manage the funds um, reasonably every year. And that's why we've come up with these target spending amounts. That's why, to uh, uh, Commissioner Zuniga's point, the state you do say it may issue a statement of interest. I, uh, I would echo that it's a great idea, so okay. that for planning purposes, you'll get a sense of what the projects are. That's good. And, and by the way, it could turn out, uh, you know, after that process, after a process like that, that we decide, for example, that for transportation projects, we might be better off coming up with a stepped percentage we could have a larger percentage for smaller projects because, of course, we could afford them right. easy, more, you know, be easier. Mm -hmm. um, and as, as the project cost increases, this is where other resources are critical, state and even, in some cases, federal funding or bonding, et cetera. And that's, uh, that could be another, another way to you know, plan for the future. Um, there's one detail, uh, one further detail in the guidelines themselves. I'm going to turn to Joe to help explain further. Um, we've had a lot of conversation within our subcommittees about transportation funding. How do we deal with um, matching funding? How do we do with timelines? How do how do we deal with bonding, um, where our funds may not be able to be pledged because there are there are differences each year in the amount of revenues that we're going to get. So there's some things that are out there that have been considered by, uh, by the committees, but one thing that we did spend a good amount of time on is the regional allocation of funding. And uh, we mentioned that we have some prior unallocated funds, specifically from the Western region uh, in the memo, I think is on page four of the memo, where we outline the differences between the two regions. But we have some funds that were not allocated last year um, and under the Commission's rule last year, funds can remain unallocated for a period of three years. And then when they, after that three years, the funds go back into the Community Mitigation Fund in general, which can then be reallocated between the regions. And when I say between the regions, if funds go back into the Community Mitigation Fund in general, but if there's a use out in that same region, it could be reallocated right back to that region. But because we didn't want funds uh, sitting for years upon years upon years in one region when there are needs that are immediate in another region, we try to set that, that cap. But there is some uh, nuances in it on how should we treat rolled over money in terms of the three-year uh, th three cap on how long it can sit out there. So I'm going to let Joe get into that a little bit. 
Yeah, I don't want to get uh, too far down into the weeds on this on this issue, but what it comes down to is th the question is: Do we spend old money first, or do we spend new money first? And when you do this calculation, what winds up happening is if you spend the old money first, generally a smaller amount of money would build up in the fund for that region. It, or excuse me, a, a larger amount of fun money will build up in that region. If you spend the new money first, it's a smaller amount. So it's really a policy decision uh, for, for, the, for the commission. Um, you know, allowing more money to build up in a region, um, you know, the, the pro of that is that you now have sort of a pot of money if a, if a large project comes along that, uh, that needs a larger amount of money uh, to do that. Sort of the downside of that is if, if another region has a lot of needs that can't be met by their allocation, allowing money to build up in the other region uh, might not allow some projects in, in the other region to go ahead that it might be worthy projects. So, you know, I think that, that we want a decision on one way or the other, but I don't think there's a, there's a real answer to it. Um, I, but, it but it's just purely a policy decision on how much money you want to allow to build. And this is all a potential. You know, if, if uh, the regions spend the money that's allocated, then the decision never comes to light. But it is, uh, stems from the three-year policy. Correct. Correct, yes. Have you done any math to know if the, the length of that time helps on this issue? And then I turn it over to Commissioner Cameron, my apologies. Yeah, I mean, I did a sort of a, a fictional uh, scenario where a, a region's allocated $4 million and they spend $2 million every year, which we obviously know that's not going to be the case. Right. What ends up happening is uh, if you spend the old money first, that uh, pot of money would build up to about $8 million and then would sort of stabilize at that level. In the other way, it builds up to about $4 million and stabilizes at that level. You spend the, the new money first. So that's sort of the order so of So the policy was determined to be three years by chance at one point because it seemed right. If it were two years, the, the problem would be alleviated somewhat. So the shortening of the, poli the, the year, but how, what would the implications of shortening the? Well, I, I think the, it was, there was definite agreement um, among both the East and the West that three years was a reasonable amount of time mm -hmm. because some of these projects, again, the bigger projects, they take a while to develop mm -hmm. and, and having some uh, security in the knowledge of, the, of how much money is available for that was important to, to both of the regions. So, so I think it's just really, it's, it's a matter of what do you feel comfortable with a higher level of money in the region or a lower level of money in the region? And it probably doesn't matter much for the first year. I mean, you could say today, that we want to spend the old money first and see how it goes, and then you know and see sort of where the balances wind up in the next year. And you can always change the policy, mm -hmm. you know, as you go along. I think it makes sense to use the the old money. It's similar to what we've done in the past with reserves. You have to use those. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I just remember initially there was such strong feelings, in particular from Western Mass, that their monies are allocated to the West. You know, um, so I just think we're sending that message that look, that money's there for your region, um, and then, you know, if we see something else a couple of years from now, whatever, that maybe that'll change. But for right now, it just seems to me, it's kind of what we've done. You know, um, uh, allocating, uh, keep it, keep it out there. Um, use the old money first. I, that was a good analogy, though. That that makes the point, four million versus eight million, but it just seems to me, um, for now, I don't see a reason to change it. Yeah, and I think the, the other thing is that we're, you know, there's now more money going into the community mitigation fund than has been previously, and I think we're probably gonna be in a little bit of a ramp up period to get to the point where we're spending all of the money that's being allocated just because the cities and towns will get used to this and, you know, it, going from a smaller amount to a larger amount might to take somewhat of a, a ramp up. So. Either way, I, I agree that uh, the, the old money first seems more prudent, you know, because we come from an original fund that was supposed to be uh, together. So bringing it back to then be reallocated is, is in my mind, you know, fair to both regions. Um, the, the, the one thing in my mind, and I know you're working on this, and um, the um, Managing these is going to get you know more and more uh, right. um, difficult right. uh, because there will be many instances just like the scenario that you point out where they spend partially, 
or where the project slips, uh, you know, from two and a half years to three and a half, and and all of those things we're going to have to then uh, account for in some way uh, to be able to be fair to everybody, regardless of whether you were using uh, old or or uh, uh, first money uh, first. It's that reversion that uh, that is going to be you know important to track of. I want to just throw out some kudos out to Mary Thurlow, uh, who's been, for the last forever, I think, <laughs> has been <laughs> trying to take a look at, because we, we've developed some intricate rules here, um, yes. and yeah, yeah, we, we like our rules, but, uh, but they're, they're difficult to try to keep track of, and one of the big rules is that, hey, we granted these reserves many, many eons ago, and we wanted to make sure that the reserves didn't sit out there. So the, the, the rule was, you have to spend your reserves before you spend your grant. Um, but people apply for a certain grant value, and then we say, we've given you a $350,000 award. But in reality, it's not a $350,000 award, it's 350 minus the reserve that you got many years ago. And accounting for that in each individual year, it becomes quite a chore. And, uh, and especially when we start looking at regional difficulties, yes. how the spend was, how that applies to who has what, you, the accounting gets difficult. Mm -hmm. Any further questions for? No, just for comment. When this came up yesterday, when you were briefing me, I mean, my first instinct was first in, first out, which I think seems to make the most sense. It seems to just echo what everyone else is saying, but that seems to be the way to go. So we can uh, in the draft. It's on page five. There's two words that are highlighted in yellow: first, last. Um, and so what we can do is we can express the views of the commission. Um, as, as you stated today, but we could still brief all of our committee members that it remains an issue, and th they will know what first last means. And so by the time we come back here in December, we can finalize that. I, I would just, I, I agree with the, you know, we'll, we'll see what kind of feedback we get, but I do like the first in, first out uh, approach. I would, um, I would suggest on the workforce development it's not really a pilot anymore because we've been doing it for, for coming up in four years. But, um, you know, let's keep in mind as we talk to the local communities about some things that I know we saw in the past. We saw contributions from communities in terms of matching funds. Um, I'd like to see if we could get back to a place where this issue was of critical need by the communities that we could see how they would step up and maybe think about a reward for uh, a match as opposed to just the regional cooperation. So more of a question to put out to the folks that we talked to. I uh, also want to mention something that uh, we did get some pretty extensive comments uh, from at least one of our members on workforce grants and I, I think we're, we're running through a lot of those recommendations now and we will in terms of how does this fit within the overall workforce world? How do we prioritize our funding? I know, Director Griffin, maybe you want to uh, mention a couple points of how we're hoping some of these funds are targeted into, into next year. So we have um, included in the guidelines um, an interest in focusing on areas like hospitality, um, uh, vocational-based ESOL, um, areas that are highly aligned with the casino's need and, and also the potential to impact um, area businesses. So that's, uh, uh, we've included um, language in the guidelines. Any further questions for John and his team? Uh, a special shout out to Mary, because we do know that behind John's notebook <laughs> great deal of your work. So thank, thank you, Mary, oh, yeah, um, thank you. for everything. And now, uh, John, I believe you have a next item great. regarding your local community mitigation fund advisory committee and another appointment. Yeah, so uh, commissioners, thank you. Next on the agenda, we respectfully request the approval by the commission of a new member to the local community mitigation advisory committee for Region B. Uh, to fill the Chamber of Commerce position. 
Uh, we'd like to thank Kate Kane for all of her work with the committee for all of these past several years. Uh, indeed, she hung on uh, for a good number of years beyond which she had hoped to uh, move <laughs> off from the committee. And that was great, greatly appreciated because it is such a challenge to get a quorum. And, and she always had such great contributions. We really thank her for, for everything that she had to uh, recommend to us and for her uh, stick to um, The new member we'd like to recommend is Allison Ebner. Uh, Ms. Ms. Ebner has a wide variety of experience, um, but I'm going to turn this over to Commissioner Stebbins, uh, who can provide you a little more detail on uh, Ms. Ebner. Sure. Thanks, John. Um, I made a promise to John when I joined the Community Mitigation Fund that I would do everything I could to help recruit members so he could have a quorum. Um, I was encouraged to see Ms. Ebner's name put forward by the Springfield Regional Chamber. Uh, I actually uh, grew up in the same town with uh, with Miss Emder. We attended school together, um, but I think she is going to be a valuable voice to the uh, to the work of the Region B um, Local Community Mitigation Advisory Committee. We know that impacts on the workforce uh, will continue to be a priority topic for the Community Mitigation Fund and the work in the work that they do, the work that John and, and his team does. Uh, her breadth of experience, I think, working with employers, serving on the Chamber's Legislative Steering Committee, her work at uh, Associated Industries in Massachusetts, I think, gives her a unique perspective and ultimately us a unique perspective on the employment and labor landscape in Western Mass. Uh, she's got certainly a direct pipeline to the, a lot of the employers potentially being impacted. Uh, I know at one point she also worked for a local uh, temporary employment uh, company in Springfield, so she's also had the opportunity to interact with, with job seekers as well. So I think she'll be a, a good addition, and I would move that we approve her uh, appointment as the chamber representative to the Region B Lickman. And do I have a second? I second that. Any discussion? Thank you for bringing forth a great candidate. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0. It's always impressive when someone's a busy person is willing to volunteer like this. So mm -hmm. we do appreciate your recruiting efforts and for people uh, like Ms. Ebner for stepping up. Yeah, I was pleased to see her name put forward by the chamber. So appreciate their help in recruiting as well. So John and team, this is incredibly important work. Can you just remind the public how many, uh, what we gave out in terms of new um, monetary value last for last year? So uh, we had a total of $4.1 million in grants, uh, but for new funding, it was approximately $3.9 million. Uh, the, the SERPED grant, the Technical Assistance Tribal Grant, continues, we, uh, we, we paid for that, paid for that several years ago, but that uh, 4.1. So in comparison to the 11.5 that we're recommending for this upcoming year, it's a significant increase, uh, but we do have some, some funds left in reserve despite that increase. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Commissioners. Thanks. Thank you. Do we need a break to get our guests set up? Yeah, I Mark, think it makes you need sense. To set up? It's, it's ten yeah. of them. Um, it's ten of eleven now. So why don't we convene at eleven, and we're going to move ahead, uh, move in fact backwards on our agenda, to um, item number three, and our presentation on the uh, pilot program in Chinatown. So thank you. Good morning again. We're reconvening um, <clears throat> meeting number 280. <coughs> we did go out of order on our agenda today, and we are now uh, looking at item number three. And Director Vanderlyn, Director Vanderlyn Linden, if you could um, make an introduction. Please. Sure. Uh, I don't think we have audio here. Yeah. All right. Um, Good after, uh, good morning, uh, 
Chair Judd Stein and Commissioners. Um, I am joined uh, by Dr. Carolyn Wong. Uh, uh, Dr. Wong is um, a professor at UMass Boston in their Institute for Asian American Studies. Um, I'm also joined by uh, Giles Lee. Um, he's the executive director of the Boston Chinatown Neighborhood Association, or Center, Center, sorry, BCNC. Um, today we're going to talk to you um, about a, um, a study that they had done that was funded um, from out of the, the research agenda funding. Um, uh, the title of it actually is, has been updated. It's talking about casino gambling, community voices from Boston Chinatown. Um, and before a couple, I wanted to do a couple things before I turn it over to them. One is I want to acknowledge that um, we have some guests today. Um, we have uh, several students from Tuf Tufts University and their MPH, Master in Public Health program. Um, and Dr. Uh, Carolyn Rubin is the is their professor, and she's she's back there as well. Um, I think it's great that we have some students here, and it's exciting to see that we can provide an opportunity to see policy in action. Um, so welcome. Um, I also just I just want to give a little bit of background on on how we got to this specific study and where we're taking. So by now, you're all very familiar with the general population baseline um, survey that was fielded in 2014 um, and released in 2015. Um, the, that type of broad-based population survey does a, a good job of providing over, an overall prevalence um, rate of problem gambling, at-risk gambling, as well as broad population-based understanding of gambling behavior and, and other other issues. Um, it can do, uh, it can provide insight into um, specific populations and, sub, and subgroups. Um, and then there are, are specific populations that, because of the methodology, because of the size of the study and the size of the population of Massachusetts, it really can't touch it. Um, and it was at that point, once we had that, that study in hand, we realized we needed to do a better job of trying to understand some of the groups who may be at greater risk of gambling-related harm. And so in 2018, we released an RFR. Um, and the focus of it was a study of gambling behavior among special populations in Massachusetts. Um, the objective of this arm of the, the research agenda is to advance knowledge regarding the introduction of casinos on population subgroups not reached by the initial general population baseline survey. Um, Asians or Asian Americans were, were one of the, the groups that, interestingly, um, the data that we had from the general population baseline study didn't indicate that they were at, at greater risk of developing gambling-related harm, but there is a body of research that would point us in that direction saying that this is a group that we really need to pay attention to as we introduce casinos in Massachusetts. A group that did rise to the surface um, out of the, the baseline general population survey were recent immigrants, um, which obviously there, there, there can be, not necessarily, but there can be an, an overlap in, in these two groups. And this group specifically was identified at, at greater risk, that they're coming individuals coming to the United States where gambling availability, specifically casino gambling, may be completely different and outside of the realm of what they understood from the, their country um, where they were moving from. Um, we received several proposals and, and we provided funding to, to UMass Boston, to Dr. Carolyn Wong, um, to lead this specific, to lead this specific study. Um, we also, at the same time, provided funding um, for a study of uh, understanding gambling behavior among um, uh, black males and a study of veterans, uh, veteran and gambling behavior um, to the um, Bedford VA. Um, after, uh, we, we, after this initial round of studies, we went back and we, we tweaked it a little bit. Um, we still offer funding that would target um, specific groups, but we changed it to a community-engaged research. Rather than us saying what the issue is or who we want to target, we let the communities tell us what, what the issue is and what, what 
what problem or what question they have. Um, and um, uh, I'm also very excited about that. In fact, I, I hope that we can talk about kind of the extension of the, the current study led to the uh, a proposal that was submitted by, um, by BCNC and, uh, and we fund it. So um, Giles, should, uh, I hope you can tell us a little bit more about that after we, after we end. So with that introduction, rather long, I apologize. I'm going to um, turn it over to Dr. Wong. We want to thank the commissioners for supporting this project and the Gaming Research Advisory Committee, um, especially Mark Vander Linden, who has supported this from its inception. We've had many conversations also with um, Enrique Zunigo. And we're very grateful for, for your um, consultations and lots of engaging discussions. Um, we had a a very lively, fairly large, multilingual lingual and intergenerational research team. And I um, will, their names are there. The research was a collaborative project, a community collaboration between the Institute for Asian American Studies, where I am, and the Boston Chinatown Neighborhood Center, Giles Lee is the executive director there. And we also partnered with the Massachusetts Council on Compulsive Gambling. And so I just want to acknowledge that this was a, um, a, a, a very fruitful partnership. There were also organizations in Chinatown um, that helped us uh, recruit participants, gave us advice, and um, I won't go into all of their names right now, but I just want to say that the, the opening of the Encore Casino, or its prospective opening, when we um, began this project, aroused a lot of concern about the possibility and likelihood that there would be heightened risk because it is so close to Chinatown. And not only heightened risk to residents and workers in Chinatown, but other Chinese Asian American enclaves that are practically at its door. There is one in Malden, a Chinese community, immigrant community there with similar demographics uh, as Chinatown. Um, there is a concentration of Chinese in Charlestown. And all are easily, you know, they can get to the casino very easily on public transportation or through the shuttle, and then there is um, the public transportation from Quincy. But when we started, um, we, um, the casino had not opened. So we, we, we wanted to find people in Chinatown whom we could interview who were casino patrons. Um, and, at, and the popular place to go a couple of years ago was the Connecticut casinos, mm -hmm. Foxwood and Mohegan Sun. And so we, we uh, found people in the community who had been to one of, one of those casinos or perhaps Twins, Twin Rivers in the past 60 days, and we interviewed uh, 23 people. Um, the focus was to find low-wage workers, low-wage service workers. And because we knew they were not included in the Sigma study, <laughs> and we knew that because the Sigma study was not conducted in any Asian languages and had a broad population sampling method that, that would not have reached this population in Chinatown. Um, also because the literature, the scientific literature, makes clear that people who are low income, uh, immigrant, um, who are under stress from difficult jobs, and the Chinese uh, service workers in Chinatown work very long hours, some of them, some of them six days a week, and this the, the only day that they get off, some of them may go to the casino. Um, these people are at high risk for gambling problems. In, and Sigma pointed out some of those factors, but did not look at Chinatown in particular. Um, so for, for the, 
the, the residents or workers in Chinatown who go to the cas Connecticut casinos, um, they make up a very large proportion of the customer base. Um, and I, I have here some, some figures that in 2006, for example, um, one of their marketing senior executives said that um, Asian Americans make up 20% of its business. It is our most robust segment of growth. It's easy to spend capital on a fast growing market. Now, Encore Casino um, is not, it seems, targeting the low wage immigrant sector as its main um, people they're trying to draw to the casino. Casino For Asian Americans, the style of the casino is, is, is more appealing, I think inten intended to be more appealing for people like tourists, more wealthy. On the other hand, it's very close. And if you take a walk through the casino, which I've done a, a few times, um, you will find a large proportion of Asian Americans there, just visually, I, haven't, I don't have any data. But you know, playing table games, as in any of the other casinos which markets around the country um, targeted ethnic marketing for Asians. And, and we just checked um, the, the number of bus lines. I don't know if you are familiar that with, the, with the casino buses that go to Chinatowns and other Asian enclaves and with low cost rides, bring them to the casinos, give incentives like you know, free, free meal tickets or, or free, free credit to do some gambling. It's um, a, a market that the American and international cas casino industry has very sophisticated methods to target and draw them to the casino. Um, the population of, of, of Asians in, in Boston or in Massachusetts is from what seven percent maybe in the state a little more in a little bit more in the in Boston, but the proportion of Asian customers in the casinos is much greater. Um, now, there is a literature about how residents of Chinatowns, low wage, low income, low income communities, Asian communities, are more at risk than others. Um, and what is very important, I think, for, for us to understand at the outset of this, this project and the, the, and the project that's going to follow is that there are virtually, literally, no culturally appropriate services for this population. None that take into account their cultural background, their concepts of mental health. Um, the, in in the, um, own, one of the major clinics uh, South Cove in, in Chinatown, um, you, you need to be diagnosed as having a gambling disorder in order to get insurance to pay for your uh, treatment. May yes. I interrupt? Yes. That, that uh, fact caught my attention. Could yes. you just elaborate? This is the, the clinic, there's one major health clinic in Chinatown and you reference it as DSM-5 criteria that doesn't allow access to those services. Well, if you have to qualify by, by meeting those, one of those criteria for a gambling problem, gam gambling disorder. But a lot of Chinese will not want to go in the first place for, for this sort of evaluation of their mental health. And there are state-funded um, place, places where the state reimburses treatment, but none of those are accessible to they're this not, community. They're, phys they're physically and they're not, not as accessible, but do they have the same criteria problem? That's what I'm really getting at in terms of that you have to. No, I don't, I don't think you have, you, they don't have that, that higher and, standard of. And so this is particular to D, uh, the health clinic in China. No, I think I think it's it's a general problem. The yeah. the, the, the uh, strategic plan that the um, public health trust fund adopted with, which was written by um, the public health department, pointed 
that problem out, that there are not enough clinics or treatment centers that are supported by state, you know, where you can get state reimbursement. Those clinicians or those cl institutions can get reimbursement from the state for treatment. There are very few, and there are definitely few, not any, that, that uh, will provide a bilingual and culturally appropriate uh, service. Yeah, if, yes. if I could just, uh, you know, expound on that. There, uh, the barrier is that a lot of people don't feel the need or want to go get screened. Um, there is a larger problem, and this is a lot of what we talk with our partners at DPH, uh, that there's not enough screening altogether. There's, yeah. as our own Sigma project uh, identified, there's, you know, admittedly around 100,000 people with, you know, with problems at one time or another. Um, and there's very little, uh, really, uh, you know, a dozen people accessing services paid for by the state because of screening. So, so I, I, I'm just, I understand that too. I guess I'm trying to understand a, a potential solution. Mm -hmm. So there is at this particular, because this is the one that folks would access most easily, but they, is it, it, I am hearing from my fellow commissioners, it's an insurance issue that is causing that criteria or is it an institutional issue that's causing that criteria? Is it a public health practice that's causing that criteria? And are there other entities that wouldn't, that don't have those barriers so that folks can go and get help for, and don't require screening? Because that seems to be a big piece yes. of the problem of the, of here. The problem. Right. Yes. Well, I was, uh, so um, insurance coverage of a gambling disorder is, is very difficult, yeah. um, and in some states it's really non-existent. Uh, DPH has a blanket um, which allows, if there, if um, an insurance, if insurance doesn't cover it, that an individual can access, uh, or a practitioner can access the blanket as long as they're, uh, as I understand, a BSAS provider or substance abuse services. Um, and so um, I think that maybe what Carolyn is saying is that um, where there is insurance coverage, it's really, it's either people aren't getting screened or the threshold at which you would actually be eligible for those services, the um, criteria, meeting the criteria of the DSM uh, to be diagnosed with a gambling disorder is, is very high. Too high. Yeah. Too high. Um, there is, um, and that um, the BSAS, uh, the blanket that would provide coverage where there, where there is the a lower threshold. Right? Yeah, is um, that uh, there aren't providers in that area that that are ac either aren't accessing it or don't know how to access it. But the bottom line is that they're not culturally appropriate services yeah. um, in that in the Boston Chinatown neighborhood. Right, I understand the culture program. I'm just still struggling with this this barrier of the five criteria and the fact that it requires this high threshold of the problem gaining yeah. a diagnosis. So because it's for mass health or if you have private insurance to get treatment, you have to meet these criteria. Right. So there, that's that's the problem. Thank thank you. Sorry. Very I, helpful. Very helpful. Thank right. you. Um, I I think we're we're a little short on time, and so I'm going to skip through some of these these slides. These are just examples of some of the, the advertising, the marketing that Mohegan Sun and, and Foxwoods from Connecticut do in Chinatown. Um, one, of the, one of the findings is that um, the community does not have a homogeneous um, view on or, or practice or norm about gambling. Some people like to gamble, some people disapprove of gambling. Now, there is a, a kind of conventional wisdom that gambling is popular among Chinese. Chinese, you might hear people say casually, Chinese love to gamble. So, and, um, or some people might even say it's in their genes, it's in their blood. Um, we want to challenge that, that um, sweeping generalization as being inaccurate and actually um, misdirecting 
I think, people's focus on what is the problem. That um, I'm going to skip here because we're running short on time. Is that it's the material life conditions and the social and linguistic isolation of people living in Chinatown that places them most at risk. Mm -hmm. Now it's true that some kinds of social games have long been popular um, in, in, uh, among Chinese populations around the world, but these games and these Chinese style of gambling or gaming have been intensely commercialized by the casino industry. And when people go to the casinos, the style that they're playing at a table game, might be pai go poker or where you see a lot of Chinese or bakar, it's a completely different environment in which many of them have grown up playing mahjong or different styles of Chinese poker in the home on Chinese New Year's or you may see on the parks. Um, we have a small park in Chinatown. Um, or you might see some older men playing some kinds of dice or tile games. Um, the notion that Chinese just love to gamble and that's why they're in such a, um, um, in, in the casinos in such large numbers and at risk I think is tremendously oversimplified and it underestimates the problem or the potential which people around, you know, observers and uh, community advocates and s practitioners have pointed out that there are in some places practices of aggressively targeted ethnic marketing towards Asian Americans. Now, whether or not this is going to happen in, in the new casinos being introduced in uh, Massachusetts is an open question. It's too early to say, but we just want to raise a red flag, <laughs> or raise a flag that um, this is practiced in other states and other cities and around the world, and I think there needs to be careful um, monitoring and review about whether or not there, there are, for example, um, inflated uh, claims in advertising about how you can get rich or saturating in a communication market, um, you know, TV or, or posters, um, not giving adequate warning of the risk. These are the standards of ethical advertising that the gaming industry has talked about um, and we think that they should be applied among vulnerable populations, not just Asians, but other vulnerable populations. Um, I'm going to turn this over because of the, the time limitation to Giles Lee to continue to talk about some of the themes in our interviews and, and what their implications are. We have to skip I think. You know what, uh, I think you should, I don't know what time restraints you've, you've um, imposed, but we, we're always mindful of time, but your content is rich, and please. All right, okay, just go fast. All right, so I spoke about difficult low-wage jobs. So, so here, the, we, where our aim was to, to identify risk factors, and I um, talked about how we don't think that cultural propensity to gamble is, is, uh, is a good explanation for, for why there are a lot of folks at risk in Chinatown. The difficult low-wage jobs that um, people work in, and, and in, uh, I mentioned that already. The community is socially isolated and linguistically isolated. Some of our um, interviewees pointed out that there are no recreational activities that are, that, they, that are meaningful for them. There used to be um, Chinese movie theaters. There's no um, Chinese sort of shopping center that the people can go, go and walk through and just enjoy. There's no green space. Um, in fact, the only playground, so-called playground in Chinatown is just, just a, a couple square, um, it's, it's like a small area of cement right by the highway and, 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 and children or adults playing there are, are at risk for, for um, 
health problems because of the traffic pollution. And so if you're working a difficult job, long hours, and you want to relax, and, and, and there, there's nothing, nothing else to do. This is what people told us. And actually, what was interesting was that, um, in contrast, several of our interviewees said in China there were more things they could do that were healthy recreation. Um, that there were adult community centers where they could go play volleyball or basketball or watch movies. Here, you know, we have those kinds of programs for youth, but not for adults. Um, and one, one respondent who um, I quote, we quoted in, said, you know, when, when, when my son started to have a problem with gambling, we shipped him back to China <laughs> because there isn't an opportunity to gamble in casinos in China because it's illegal. But this is just to disabuse, again, the notion that there's somehow some kind of uh, cultural reason that people gamble in, from Chinatown or, or may lose control and be, have gambling problems. Because if it's not in their homeland experience in China, it became a problem once they came here to the United States and had came under stress with these difficult work conditions, lack of recreational opportunities, and social and linguistic isolation. Um, so these are some of the, the examples. I won't read them of, of what people said to illustrate this point. Um, there's no recreation. Immigrants don't know English. You know, at the, what kind of entertainment is there? There was no entertainment when we came here. Now, we found that there, there seemed to be a pattern, and this, this would have to be validated through larger study, that the younger new immigrants were some of them who had not lived this difficult life as long as the older immigrants, like who are 50 or 60. It seemed that many of them were more recreational gamblers, that they went to the casino for shopping or to have, have, a, have a night out with, with the friends or coworkers and go have a meal. And that they had not, they did not feel that they, they were, were at risk for addiction. They were just enjoying themselves. But, but the more, a larger number of people that we talked to, low wage workers in the service industry, did report risky behavior and concern about their own difficulty controlling gambling if they were older and had been living this difficult life over a longer period of time. And, and I think that the, one, one of the ways people think about problem gambling is that it's a psychological, it's an individual problem. And we want to say that people interact with their environment. They interact with their community environment, their job environment, and the casino advertising and the casino practices. And it's you have to look at the interplay of all of these things and not just say, well, that some people are prone to problem gambling. Um, and this, this uh, interviewee pointed out that um, when, he, when, when she went to the casino with her husband at first, there was nothing else to do. There was no place for her to sit. This was in Mohegan Sun, except to stand in front of or sit in front of the slot machine. And so she went to sort of monitor her husband and then ended up gambling because there was nothing else to do and then fell into the problem. Um, this one said, it, it's, it's the ambience inside that makes you go crazy. There's something about it that just makes you go crazy. And, you know, of course, there's the intense lights. There are, I mean, we know that the environment in the casino is, is a little, is, is, intense and, and tr draws people into this, this feeling of wanting to gamble and stay. And there may be free drinks, right? No place to sit. This just points to the need
for us to think about preventive prevention, preventive education and youth for youth and adults. Um, think about how we you know should monitor the ethical the ethics of marketing and practices, uh, marketing and advertising practices, and most importantly, provide culturally appropriate services which are not available at this time. And I want to turn this over now to Jack. I'm with the Boston Chinatown Neighborhood Center, BCNC. We're a, a, a social services organization with headquartered in Chinatown. Let me just um, kind of build off of what Dr. Wong has been saying. I think all of the information that she's presented today um, you know, kind of illustrates that we don't really have one reason as to why Chinese or Asian uh, communities seem to be particularly at risk for gambling addiction, but we do know that casinos have identified Asians as an important segment of their market um, and their customer base. Um, this is, seems to be an observable fact, uh, and I don't, I don't want to speculate why Asians seem to be particularly susceptible to uh, compulsive gaming or to the advertising, but that appears to be the case. Uh, so let me introduce my organization uh, and also explain why it's important to me, this issue, and I'll try to do that very briefly. My organization is the Boston Chinatown Neighborhood Center. Uh, we're a community-based social services organization founded in 1969. We're headquartered in Chinatown. We have three locations in Boston and one in the city of Quincy. We reach uh, more than 8,000 people a year, and uh, we are among the largest immigrant social service providers in New England. Um, in 2000, I think seven or maybe eight, we had a collaboration with Mass Council on Compulsive Gaming. I don't, I don't think Marlene is here. Oh, hey, hi. So, uh, but uh, in which we did public education and needs assessment around gambling behaviors in Chinatown among the Chinese population. I think that project surfaced a lot of issues in the community that um, were there. Uh, a lot of, I guess, just wives of gamblers, of people that exhibited compulsive behaviors around gaming came to us saying that financially, you know, they had financially, they were suffering financial issues or they were having a lot of arguments or their family wasn't functioning well um, and they felt it was related to their, to their spouse's um, uh, compulsive behaviors. Um, we were not at the time, even though we were a social service organization, set up to respond to any of this. We didn't have treatment, we didn't have services um, kind of uh, set up to respond to this information that we were learning. So this experience along with some other ones helped us redefine a little bit of the frame and, and the approach that we took to service provision. I mean, as I said, we were founded in 1969 and over the decades we had developed different programs to respond to different community needs, but this was something and there were other kind of issues in the Chinatown community that we just were not set up to handle. Um, I guess I'll fast forward to now. We now have four licensed clinicians on staff um, and, I'll, and we do case management for families that are going through particularly hard uh, challenges and uh, so the the relationship between Chinatown and gambling and my organization and gambling is actually pretty intertwined with this more recent development and this kind of take on the way that we approach families so one of the things that we know I mean we have uh, so one of our largest programs is our child care program it's about half of our organization and we work with children uh, starting at three months old all the way up through high school to make sure that families are helpful and healthy places for children and youth to grow up in, um, we have uh, wanted to make sure that not only are youth getting supports that they need or children getting supports that they need in our programs and in our classrooms, but that their parents and that their families are also getting supports to make sure that their home is a good place for them. Uh, and so um, that's why our clinicians, we have one licensed mental health clinician and three social workers, um, engage entire families in case management uh, more, than, uh, more often than one single individual. Um, so uh, as you can see, one of the things or one of the reasons why uh, you know, the people brought up as, um, as, a reason, as a way that they managed to stop gambling or to, to not go to the casino is because they want to make sure that their kids um, don't suffer because of their behavior. And that's something that, that we've seen. Um, also, it impacts you can see the slide is hiding gambling from family members. There are people, and this is not unique to the Chinese community, but people who exhibit compulsive behaviors, 
hide it from family members, and that can also cause um, a lot of problems. I'm looking for the, oh, okay. Um, right, and then so one of the other things that is an ongoing kind of conversation in our community is that even though we, there is a general awareness that casinos can be hard for uh, communities like Chinatown, there is also an awareness that there are a lot of jobs that come with the casino, and people sometimes feel conflicted about the fact that there's a good and also a harm that they associate with each other, and um, you know, just kind of have to understand that. So for BCNC and, and, and through, through this, this research project, I think that we wanted to make, it, it reconfirmed the way that we think about doing work in families. It's understanding and respecting that families have interdependent relationships with each other and that leveraging those for treatment, for prevention is vital. Um, and also that conceptual, we conceptualize gambling not as an individual issue as our society often does, but really as a family issue because for the well-being of the entire household, we want to make sure that people are not exhibiting addictive behaviors. Um, this slide is around civic engagement, and I think this is, we put this here intentionally because if you look at this quote, you people have, I'll read the quote, you people with power have to do something, not like us who have no money, no power. You elect someone, they should do something. You educated people should do something. Get people's kids to help. They are the real victims. This is not four quotes. This is one person's quote. And what I read in this quote is that they don't have any idea who is supposed to help, uh, what the recourse is, who is supposed to support the community as things are, uh, as they get complicated. And I take this responsibility, I take this charge quite seriously because as the largest social service provider in that neighborhood, it is important for us to help, um, and which is why I've tried to be involved in, in, situ in, uh, in projects like this, why we are committed to making sure that this information gets out to the community, and why this is not something that's kind of a fly-by-night for us, but that we really want to make sure um, there's conversation in the Chinatown and other Asian American communities about. Um, so I'm going to go into this recommendations portion of this slide deck, but before I get into those, are there any, I guess, questions um, from the commission, um, before, you know, up to clarification about any of the concepts that we've been talking about so far before we get into this? So the only question I had following up on um, that there can be a lesser standard to get access if it's an addiction specialist versus needing to qualify under the DSM-5. Are any of your licensed clinicians on staff also qualified as addiction specialists that could address that need? No. Okay. I was going to make a point after the recommendations on that, but um, since, you made, since you mentioned it, one of the things that Mark and, and Marlene uh, Warner from the uh, Mass Council um, have been talking about, um, and we've been talking to the TPH, um, is to have more designated agents um, to do uh, self-exclusion. Um, my question, and, and we can come back to that to that idea because that's 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 one of the things that dovetails into some of the recommendations. Um, uh, I did have a question, uh, and um, in your in, in 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 the report and your appendix on the questions that you asked some of the interviewees, you have a question that is in general general about knowledge of programs, uh, and I know it's probably intended to be broad, but do you have a sense not just with the interviewees, but some of the other people that you also talked to, whether there's any knowledge of the self-exclusion program in particular? Hmm. People, people can self-exclude from the casino? I don't think so. Or not widespread, probably. But I don't, I don't know. This is kind of my, my guess. So uh, guess. Yeah. we have two designated agents the, the Mass Council trained two designated agents to enroll individuals in the voluntary self-exclusion program from the Asian American Service Association. Um, you know, it's, it, and so we can, there are things that we do, I think, that are good and proactive, and I think there's a long ways that we need to go. Um, you know, we, we require that, that in order to enroll in the voluntary self-exclusion program that you need to do so with a designated agent. And the purpose behind that is so that, you know, one, they know the administrative sort of routine, um, but also that they're sensitive to the issues that the person is bringing before them um, and can respond. Um, so having two individuals is okay. We could do a lot better and would like to. Um, 
recruit more designated agents to do to do this process and find other ways that perhaps um, we can be more responsive. Uh, so if there's no other clarifying questions, I'll talk about the recommendations that we kind of came to through this process. Um, we've tried to categorize them. These are kind of um, just paying attention to the culturally appropriate prevention and services for Asian Americans. Um, one is public health campaigns. I mean, I know that public health communications campaigns can have an impact on the way that the, uh, the community looks at certain public health issues um, and can change uh, uh, attitudes and behavior over time. Um, and oh, and I should mention, I mean, all of these recommendations that we're laying out, I don't think that we have an expectation that we will put this out and somebody else picks it up and does it. Of course, we're putting these out as things that we would like to be involved in, we would want to be held accountable to if we were involved in, that we hope that a number of players, including Mass Gaming Commission, but not exclusively, would come together around and help us strategize for. So this is the beginning of a conversation, definitely, and not a set of recommendations that we expect to have nothing to do with after today. Um, so the second one is treatment services. As uh, Dr. Wong mentioned, uh, more treatment services and culturally appropriate wellness programs. Three, preventative education and services for casino workers of Asian descent and of immigrant background. I believe that there are some things in place, um, but uh, maybe just more engagement with the community around what, what is possible. Four, provision of state-supported reimbursement uh, for services. And then five, uh, training of professional addiction counselors in community settings. Um, as I think Dr. Wong had mentioned when she was talking about it, um, sometimes mental health settings can be a, a barrier uh, that people don't want to enter them but people are quite comfortable coming to places like our organization or other organizations that they go to for an, an, any number of other reasons um, also uh, participation participa participatory deliberation and regulatory process not so many syllables so few words uh, so six engagement <coughs> of community-based organizations and professionals knowledgeable about our communities in goal setting for reducing negative impact of uh, the casino gaming in the low income Asian populations. I think this would be interesting in the nonprofit sector. We do always set goals. We do not always hit them, um, but they are something that we kind of measure our success with. And uh, I would be interested in seeing if there were some way to get convene thought leaders and other leaders in the community to think about what are the goals that we're trying to hit. And if we hit them to celebrate that, and if we don't figure out how else we can go about planning activities. Also, community engagement at the grassroots level in public policy deliberations. I think public meetings like this and others are good uh, starts for that. And a formation of a regulatory advisory committee to review the ethics of targeted ethnic marketing practices toward vulnerable populations. Um, yes, that's clear. Uh, and then for expanded scope of collaboration and services, uh, nine, a co-learning and mutual support coalition of community-based organizations that provide family support and wellness programs for immigrant and refugee communities in the region. This is something that I've been interested in from the beginning is reaching out to other Asian American organizations to kind of learn from each other's practices mm -hmm. and see if there's some way we can leverage each other's resources or expertise for the betterment of more people. And also community-based efforts to provide healthy and culturally appropriate recreational alternatives uh, to casino gaming in local neighborhoods. And then the last set of recommendations is about research. Um, so looking ahead for future research, um, want an increased understanding of social economic impacts of legalized casino gaming in ethnically diverse Asian American communities. I imagine this is true um, in other at-risk communities as well. Um, 12, culturally appropriate health communication approaches for research dissemination and implementation in Asian American communities. We were having a conversation about this literally in the hallway. Uh, this report is being released. We'd like to figure out how we can disseminate it um, as, as, as into the Chinatown community as well. Uh, do we need to translate the entire report? Do we just translate the summary? Do we need to translate the slide deck? Um, we don't actually know yet. I think we need to talk to somebody who's experienced in health communications to make sure that the information reaches all the people that it needs to reach. 13, the methods to obtain representative samples for hard to reach populations. I know Dr. Wong really stretched her team pretty thin because a lot of people don't like to talk about this issue. Um, and so uh, we can 
if we can build up an awareness of the importance of talking about this issue, we may be able to also make it easier to research the population. And the last point here is the expansion of research on Asian Americans in general, prioritizing um, a, a next step study around issues, prevention, treatment in communities. And we've named specific communities that are kind of um, peer communities to Chinatown, Vietnamese and Cambodian communities, and geographically, that's Dorchester, Quincy, Lowell, Malden, and Worcester. Uh, we actually do have, we did submit a proposal to Mass Gaming um, in the last round of, R of, of RFPs with this concept, um, and, which was funded. Um, and so we appreciate Mass Gaming Commission's kind of um, uh, a commitment to this issue and continued learning around this issue for our community. Thank you, Mark, for helping to steward that. Um, and talking to us about how we can make sure that that works. Um, so we are really um, still in the beginning stages of learning. Um, as I think Dr. Wong had mentioned, maybe it's in the report. I don't remember if it's in the slide deck. But there's actually not that much research about the Asian American community and gambling addiction, even though it is a community that is widely known to be at risk. Um, some of it is people not wanting to do research, and some of it is people not knowing uh, methods of being uh, really effective methods of getting participation. So, um, you know, we we are uh, we appreciate the opportunity to be among the few uh, research studies that's going out to the public to kind of inform the public conversation around these issues in our community. I was just going to say, it, as evidenced by the the difficulties in in doing this study, that that is also a, a barrier. That it takes a lot of time and resources in order to do. Uh, a study of um, to do this type of study, and yeah. so um, it's uh, that presents a lot of challenges for researchers. Um, so I think this ends our um, presentation, right? Uh, so I guess if there are any questions about this, we'd be happy to try to Question, answer. Questions, commissioners, um, Bruce. Yeah, thank you. Um, first of all. Uh, Compliments to you and the team and everybody who participated in the research project. Um, Dr. Wong, I think as you alluded to, Director Lee, there was uh, a lot of what I would characterize as eye-opening information um, and compelling information that, um, uh, at least for me, was um, new um, and informative. Um, and I. I Two comments. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, Mark, as you go about doing your work, I think this would be a great ongoing agenda topic uh, for us to keep considering. I know from our conversation yesterday, you're already thinking of some different ideas and our partnership with the Mass Council as to how we might be able to get to some of these recommendations. Um, but secondly, and we've had this conversation before with what additional stakeholders can take advantage of the research that we're doing. I happened to be at a workforce summit meeting and statewide workforce summit meeting yesterday with Director Griffin. And I had gone through the executive summary part of the report and understood that there were many references to the availability of uh, jobs with good paying wages. Uh, and just the few people that I talked about that component of the report with we're very interested in getting a copy of the report. So I want to take, you know, the, the report and share it with some of the workforce partners that, you know, again, providing people with a good livable wage job or a job with, you know, more uh, consistent hours, um, I think would be something that would be helpful to the workforce community that is focused uh, on the greater Boston area and specifically in Chinatown. So, uh, more of a comment, I guess, than a question, but thank you both for your, your good work and, and, to, uh, uh, and to all the folks that participated in the, in the research project. Thank you so much. I, um, so I have now the benefit of having uh, seen your presentation twice because I'm also part of the uh, Gaming Research Advisory Committee where you have presented. Um, and I remember you only alluded it to, it to it today, but I remember you um, in that presentation uh, mentioning just how difficult it was to recruit uh, people to get to, to get to talk to you, um, which has both uh, um, a cultural component and uh, I, I remember you mentioning the word stigma, 
quite associated with you know how difficult it is for for people in general, but perhaps also for the group that you study uh, to talk about you know somebody experiencing harm, financial and otherwise. Um, so um, you also um, you, you want to mention a little bit more to that because what on, on the recommendation that you here's here's the point that I wanted to make. We did one of your recommendations is to engage to, to try to figure out how to reach this population, uh, which we struggled with in the baseline population survey. We knew that we had to do more, and and, and we are doing that with your help. Um, so if you are finding it hard to reach that population, um, the question is really for, for all of us, including who, you know, others who might not be uh, here or listening. How, how do we do that? How do we go about furthering this effort of reaching for both, not just research, importantly, for um, understanding of programs and services, to making them available, uh, and, 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 and so on. We have, we have a, a plan, a short-term plan, and this is just a first step um, to hold, the, the first problem is just to open up the conversation gradually in the community, to make it acceptable for people to talk about this outside of their immediate families, which is where the conversation takes place. Um, as Giles mentioned, we, we want to bring on board some health communication experts. I have some experience in, in this um, in other public health areas. And part of the, of, of the solution may be to have age and generation specific education and outreach, that is youth they may have, think about this quite differently from their parents or their grandparents because many of them are go going to U.S. schools and you know, they're not so uh, constrained about talking about it. But when they get in, in the family setting, they may not feel that they can challenge or, you know, their parents if they think their parents have a gambling problem. Or, and, and they also, there is a lot of Pressure. There is a lot of, uh, there is a long-standing norm in, in in Chinese families that you don't talk about problems like this outside of the family because it would dishonor the family. So, if you have age-specific education where the youth are, are sort of more eager to talk about it and the parents are less eager or quite reluctant to talk about it, you have to have, be very sensitive about how we unfold an educational campaign. So we don't want to disrupt family solidity. On the other hand, we want it to bring people along in, in, in an intergenerational way. Um, and so we're going to hold some workshops um, about this report. But as Giles says, we have not gotten, we, we, we need sort of another phase of, of funding for this, actually. But we, we, um, we want to have workshops that, that can explore how to take the message, multimedia, um, small workshop conversations um, in the community agency settings and also outside of those settings where it may be in, in a residence apartment, uh, you know, gathering place or in the school, something like that. Uh, I'll add, this, yeah. this concept of face is uh, very powerful uh, in uh, Chinese and other Asian communities is that you, you don't talk about your troubles to anybody outside of your family, sometimes not in your family either. Um, and uh, the, uh, I think if I had a solution, I would definitely share it, but I don't think we know quite yet how to make sure that we can kind of break down this stigma and make it acceptable for people to talk about this and also to seek help around it. There was a study done around about 15 years ago that determined that of all race groups in this country, Chinese immigrants were the least likely to seek help for personal problems. And the second least likely were Chinese Americans or American-born Chinese. So um, it's not 
uh, a value in our community to seek help for problems, um, as it is in some other communities. Um, one other thing that I would say is that the reason why an organization like ours can sometimes be effective in doing this is because they have a relationship with us, which is sometimes I'm a parent in childcare, my child goes here, or I go here for special events, I come here for art classes, you know, I come here for, for, for uh, yoga classes, you know, it's a, it's a, many different things are available here, and in addition, I also know that they have support for these kind of more serious challenges. That was one way that we started to um, be, were able to bring uh, uh, families into us for issues around domestic violence or child abuse and neglect was by developing a relationship with them as a service provider in other ways first. Um, but even so, these are difficult topics um, and many people still will not disclose them uh, until, they're, until they're really under pressure. Uh, so um, I think we hope to be able to break some similar headway on mm -hmm. this issue, but um, we, we hope that we can work together. I think therein lies the, the, the hope. Um, you know, the one, the one thing you mentioned in terms of uh, protective factors is itself the family ties and the social networks. And so um, to the effect that we could collectively, and again with others, specifically I'm thinking of the Department of Public Health, uh, collaborate on, 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 these, on this topic, uh, try to leverage those social networks where possible and try to um, work together, uh, you know, again, uh, making, making, uh, taking advantage of that protective factor. Um, on that ground, um, another thing that we have been considering that we need to get cranking is something else Ma uh, Marlene uh, Warner has, has mentioned, that that is a notion of a third party exclusion um, process. Um, what is your general feeling for how that might be helpful in your community or not. In the, the idea being that somebody can go to court and petition a family member um, to be excluded from the casino where all of the jackpots would be confiscated if they ever yeah, it, um, were. Uh, it, this is just my, my opinion. Uh, mm -hmm. We haven't done research on this. I think that um, in, in the extre extreme case of family you know, financial or marital disaster, that might be helpful. But one one factor, one thing about immigrant communities, Chinese communities, uh, there's because of homeland experiences and perhaps the perception of politics and government. There, there, there's a little reluctance to go to, to government agencies or government authorities, especially the courts, mm -hmm. um, to solve these sorts of problems. Um, a little distrust of, of government. Understood. Yep. And, and that's why, you know, it would not be the first avenue, I don't think. I think the kinds of approaches that Giles has, has talked about, going to a trusted um, community organization, or trusted social networks, mm -hmm. churches, um, teachers that you trust. The, that, that is, I think, more, more promising than, you know, I'm not against, I, I'm not saying this is not a bad proposal, I'm just not sure how it will resonate and, and be used in this community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I really like your um, recommendations because they are community-based and uh, you know what really will help I think is important also I think it's critical for us to I mean the marketing you showed is out of state so I think our casinos are so new that it's too soon to tell right what the effect will be but it's critical to watch that and research those things and um, but I think already putting in place some of the um, you know, where you see the gaps or where you see how to be more effective in the community. I think that's, those are critical pieces. Yeah, and, and you know, just as uh, certain groups are targeted, um, certain prevention efforts can also be targeted. Mm -hmm. And that is where, um, where we, I believe, can, can play a, a very important role. Um, we have just back on the point on um, 
something you mentioned uh, uh, relative to your recommendations. Um, we do. We are perhaps that um, that uh, body that you suggest should look at the advertising practices, at least when it comes to uh, Ameri uh, Massachusetts casinos. We do have a, in our responsible gaming framework uh, quite a bit of language and strategies relative to looking at responsible practices, responsible advertising practices, and we would be, I, I would submit, we would be the first ones to want to know if, if you or others believe that any one of the licensees that we uh, license um, are beginning to engage in deceptive advertising practices. Targeted is one thing, um, and again, my response to that is let's target prevention efforts you know, equally or more. Uh, but advertising practices do begin to you know, border on uh, uh, not responsible at some point, and we would want to, again, hear, hear from members like you uh, if you begin to notice that. It's great to know. Commissioner O'Brien, do you have a question? Um, <clears throat> I have a question from uh, Director Van Linden. Um, Game Sense Advisors, they are multilingual at Encore and at Springfield. Do they, what Asian languages do we cover? Um, I know they cover Vietnamese at least. Uh, Mandarin, uh, Cantonese, Vietnamese. Uh, we have uh, game sense brochures translated into um, traditional and simple Chinese um, and Vietnamese. Um, so we can continue to monitor whether that provides sufficient accessibility to those kinds of interventions uh, in terms of the, it sounds as though we have quite a bit of the language covered, maybe not the same mm -hmm. um, coverage that you provided in your research. I think there's there's room for us to grow in this in this specific to area too. Um, yeah, I, I think is there a specific campaign that we could um, direct towards um, the Asian Asian community? Um, are there specific types of messaging that would be more effective than other types of messaging that would communicate kind of the game sense principles and ideas? Um, it's something I, I, you know we. We adopt game sense from the British Columbia Lottery Corporation, and I believe they actually have a specific campaign um, for this. And uh, and so I'd be interested in trying to tap into that, but also try to understand that Massachusetts may have some very specific uh, needs. Needs. I should also know. I don't know. Or in terms of play my way, we're more restricted on language accessibility. Or oh, I would need to take a look at that. Um, uh, yeah. I could take so that's that. another another yeah. way we should make sure it's accessible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or, uh, but there might be a technical a technical challenge to that. Yeah. We. I, yeah. We. As we especially as we develop it for as MGM and Encore, we could take a look at that. But I it do. Does, I, okay. Go ahead. I, I'll, I just um, before I forget we, uh, especially before Encore opened, um, the GameSense team did a, a good job of reaching out to, to different um, uh, community organizations, specifically targeting the Asian American communities. Um, I asked for a, a list of all of those agencies that, um, that they reached out to, and, and it, was, it, was, it wasn't unsubstantial. I mean, it's, uh, they've done some really good work. Um, and they have a Game Sense advisor who I believe has come before us, uh, Lynn Ho, um, yes. who's done a fantastic job yes. in that Very in that area. Nice. Game Sense has a specific area in which I think that we can be really helpful, um, yes. and um, and I think that we should do whatever is within our power to do that. Our responsible gaming framework um, has a specific, um, I think, can be specifically helpful and. Um, you know, demystifying gambling, addressing specific superstitions, um, encouraging people to take a break, um, looking at other activities besides gambling that, uh, as forms of recreation. There needs to be other forms of recreation available, but there are very specific game sense principles that I think are, are incredibly relevant. Our framework is, is relevant, but how do, we, how do we tailor it? How do we make it specific? And I think that there's, there's you know, that's a good opportunity for a partnership with 
So we'll conclude easy. today, but I'm looking at your revised title, talking about casino gambling and community voices from Boston Chinatown. I think that probably we all share this. This is the beginning of a conversation, and this is a, a, just a, a very well done piece of work that will keep us vigilant and really begin to listen to the community voices and also make sure that we continue this conversation. We're lucky to have Mark as our director here to guide us on that. But it is, as you pointed out, it really is the beginning of um, a conversation for us. And the recommendations, as Commissioner uh, Cameron indicated, are, are uh, community oriented. And we are part of the community that we um, really hope to support uh, your efforts. And we work as partners. Yeah. Can I just say so. one last thing? <laughs> this is exactly what the research agenda is supposed that's, to do. That's it's, exactly It's supposed right. to look at hard issues um, and turn to and, and turn to the communities that, that are being affected and ask um, ask what where where are the potential paths for uh, to to make a difference here, and I, when it can be illuminated by the the research, that's that's exactly what we want. I agree, and, and this is a good time to remind uh, the public, you know, we are very thankful for the legislature's wisdom um, when it drafted 23K to really ensure that robust research agenda. It's at work here and uh, really producing great outcomes, and we thank the uh, folks from Tufts, too, for your continuing work that you're going to do in your program, the Masters of Public Health. It's all important, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll take a, a, a five. A, sure. Oh, I'm sorry. No, Were you going to say no, a, no. A, a five a minute break just as we um, start up our next? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. We're reconvening again, public meeting number 280, and we are now turning to item number six, Commission Matters, uh, the Regency follow up, and um, our Executive Director will leave, begin the conversation for us um, on Regency. So thank you, Ed. Uh, good afternoon, thank you. So in your packet, you will see a short memo um, that General Counsel and I. Uh, blue put together for you it's broken up into two sections background and possible next steps so just by way of <laughs> setting the stage uh, background is what I think you remember happened most recently the Commission uh, decided to deny a motion for reconsideration by a pre the previous applicant in Region C uh, and subsequent to that, um, that applicant sent a letter also in the packet on September 20th asking for uh, a reopening, basically, of Regency, a new RFA process in Regency. Um, so I have, and with uh, General Counsel Blue, outlined a number of potential next steps that the Commission could consider. And I do want to be, um, I want to clarify one thing. The goal uh, today, hopefully, is get some direction from the Commission if they need any assistance from staff um, getting more information on the next steps. I also want to be clear, what I didn't put in the memo but um, might be implicit is the timing on all of this is purely within the discretion of the Commission. Um, none of this is necessarily mandatory in terms of even acting on Regency. However, having said that, um, the Commission may decide that even on the timing issue, as opposed to anything more substantive, you may want either more public input, more expert input, or you may decide you have enough information. But again, I didn't put that necessarily in here, so I didn't want to imply that you are bound to make some type of decision. As I said, the goal of this is to hopefully get some direction and I will outline very briefly what potential options there are. As I said, um, there is a request to reopen Regency right away. 
that is, in fact, a option within the power of the Commission. Um, you have received uh, numerous public comments over the years, the latest of which we have included in the packet. Um, in the past, the Commission has sought um, some expert opinions or expert consultants. Uh, and before you could do that, there is a process called an RFI, Request for Information, helps define what that ultimate expert solicitation may look at. Um, so that is uh, another option. Um, the fourth option, which the Commission has always um, considered when evaluating region-specific impacts, are to go to the region itself and get some live feedback from individuals. Um, and, is it, and I also say in the memo, uh, aside from the request to reopen Region C, the rest of the options are not unique or specific. There's a, you could do multiple, one, two, or, or um, a, a variation of them. Um, so uh, it, it really is, as I said today, to try and get some, some feedback, some sense of where the commission is. I will also note uh, present today in the audience, Senator Mark Pacheco, uh, Senator from the first uh, Plymouth and Bristol uh, region, which is in Region C, and specifically has both Taunton and Wareham in that, uh, in that region, um, is present. Uh, so uh, that is by way of introduction. I don't know if you have any questions. So before, before we begin discussions, this is, of course, a, um, and we appreciate the memo, it, it does help us um, with our conversation. It gives us a, a bit of a roadmap to think about uh, how we should think about Regency. With that said, this doesn't limit us, and I know that Ed intends yeah. that. It does conclude, um, you'll see in the memo, that um, the Commission staff, our legal department, is, has been following the status of the federal uh, legislation and uh, litigation that relates particularly to the, the tr complicated tribal matter. I know that in the past I've asked for that update, and I think it probably it's, it's a good time to actually update us more formally through a, a memorandum. It's very complicated, it I is, think. It is not uncomplicated. <laughs> and, then, and you know that's one of my favorite phrases. Uh, so um, I don't know if you'll want to get outside assistance to complement ours or if we can do it internally, but I do think probably that needs to be formalized because it's a, um, an important part of the overall Regency dis evaluation discussion. Do you, do you agree? Does the timing seem right on that piece? Yeah, I, I agree. I think um, I, well, I think we need. I think in general we need more information, and specifically that's a critical piece of. So that so that's kind of just one one piece that's pretty concrete before we got into the more uh, the bigger discussion. Yes. So can absolutely. we include that on the checklist? That would be great. Got it. And we've so, done it in the past, and we we. We did have a, an expert, someone in tribal gaming, right, that, that came in and at least testified. Yeah. I'm trying to remember if we... I think you are right, Commissioner. What I'd try, let, let us take a first stab at it and try and give you something that's somewhat neutral as opposed to an advocacy piece. Um, well, that's what that's, we're looking for yes. here. That's exactly what we're looking for, you right. know, really uh, to digest a very complicated legal, and I guess there are you know, through the legislative piece, there's, a, there's political implications which are, make it less definitive, but we should at least sure. understand that there's, there's uh, that part of the puzzle as well. Right, and I think with uh, two new commissioners, they haven't um, really had the benefit of uh, that, those previous discussions, and um, so, so we wouldn't be looking for necessarily testimony, well, let me say this, to get, um, if, if we're going to get somebody to take a look at, a, uh, you know, the tribal gaming, it wouldn't necessarily be from our tribe, our local tribe, right? We're talking about someone that has a good working knowledge overall of uh, tribal gaming. So I think there are two pieces. There's two, uh, as I understand it, there are two pieces of lit uh, litigation, one in the First Circuit and one in District right. Court in D.C. 
at a minimum, a report on those, a, you know, an understandable report for lawyers and sort of non-lawyers about the implications of, of both those pieces of litigation yes. and how they relate yes. or not, I think would be important. Yes. Uh, there will be people who want who will want to speculate on the impacts of those. We'll have to see about whether that's helpful or not. Was it, was it I think Michael and Carol that may have pre uh, presented a memo many years ago on? There was, yeah, there were, there were a couple of uh, memos. I, I'm, I'm recalling um, um, a hearing that we uh, mm -hmm. went to in, in, um, in Mashpee where we actually got the benefit of the, of the four and the, of the competing um, views on the predictions and assessment. The assessment and prediction of the legal matter at the time of the tribe. Um, we, I, I don't know that we will have necessarily the benefit of those two sides, for lack of a better word, this time. I think what, we, what I hear you all um, I, I suggesting is we need just an update on where things currently stand. Yes, different exactly. From, different from before. Yes. Exactly. Uh, just the update uh, and mainly around the legal, right. um, the legalities. That just the current status. Where, where, where those two um, well, paths the are. Legislative and the, the legal sure. front. Mm -hmm. Well, I would add one to these and maybe there's a, a bit of a theme emerging here <coughs> uh, that, that is around the notion of gathering more information and and there's 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 quite a bit of um, reports that you know were done and a couple of those have been updated that are available to us some include our own but some around us I think we would benefit from a summary of those uh, reports what they have um, uh, the key findings or the key uh, aspects and the variables um, and how they have been updated. Um, Are you talking about market analysis? Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry, I missed that. Market analysis you're talking about. Yeah, you're referring I'm, I'm, to. I'm, but I'm referring to existing reports yeah. um, and some that have been updated mm -hmm. recently. Um, yeah, I'm just concerned that it, with our history of uh, reviewing so many different market analysis, from uh, applicants, they are um, they are useful, but they are written for a particular client. Mm -hmm. um, and I just think if for us to understand this market as it exists today, Region C, um, I think it would be important to conduct our own analysis in order to uh, that's not that's not looking at one project or another, but the entire region, how it's changed over the years, uh, to include what's happened around us. So what does that mean for Regency now? I, I just think looking at someone else's is useful, but if we were to really be serious about uh, having the information we need to make a good decision about Regency, um, the, the update on the tribal status as well as what is happening in the region now are, are two important pieces of information. Commissioner Stebbins, just, I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner no, Zuniga, I just want to make sure he, that we hear from him. Yeah, no, I, uh, I agree with the point that Commissioner Cameron just made. Um, and I know you've talked about this in terms of one, not only the market can bear, uh, but beyond that, and I think, um, uh, Director Bedrosian talks about it is looking at what the other, not only what the market can bear, but also what the potential, for our benefit, understanding what the potential impacts are to existing revenue streams as well as the existing jobs. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I agree with Commissioner Cameron's point. There are good reports that have been produced. It, it's, it's not to disparage or cast any doubt on the, on the providers of those reports, but uh, to Commissioner Cameron's point, they've been conducted and issued primarily on behalf of a specific client. So having a, a neutral party maybe assess and look at those and, and uh, maybe go one step beyond that and um, assess what uh, Director Bedrosian has put down as uh, item C, I think would be uh, 
I, I, item C or three? Three. Uh, three? C under three. Three C. So, three C. So um, under three, one of the um, options includes rather than immediately going out and doing an RFP for a market study, would include doing something called you know the request for information, and that would be where we could learn what what should we be doing? Um, is this the right time to be taking a step to get that market analysis done? Are there factors we should wait to go into play? Uh, what questions should we be asking? There, that is a tool that could be used. Um, and then I think what Ed did is he did list in under A, B, C, D the kinds of things that would be possibly raised in the RFI. I don't know how folks feel about an RFI or if they're familiar with that. And of course, we um, we haven't skipped one and two, but uh, three does present an opportunity if we're looking for information. And I only started right with the last paragraph because it, I, it had already been requested, so it's been out there uh, for a few, a couple of months now. What do you think about the idea of a request for information? to learn about what we should do rather than immediately doing an RFP perhaps for a costly study that they could come back and say, you know, given all Commonwealth influences, this might be early. Or come back and say, yeah, you know, let's go for it. I mean, I just wonder if that's a tool we should consider. Well, be, be, between the two, I'd be more in favor of, uh, uh, of, of an RFI. but. Um, let, let me mention perhaps what, what is going, um, has not been said, but we sh I think we should, um, that, uh, that is, you know, all the original market studies, including the applicant's own market studies, uh, and predicted levels of revenue that we have not yet seen in the current, um, uh, current licenses. Um, now, a couple of important caveats. Um, the, the normalized year of operations on those market studies uh, for the category ones were, um, was year three. Um, the normalized year of operations for category two was year two, and now we are in year four. So we're beginning to see a lot more of that uh, real-time data that we could compare to those, to those studies. Now, importantly, there's been a number of things that have happened uh, in you know since since those studies so uh, but but there's also information available there's been updates to those studies um, that I think is part of what I was trying to articulate before and there's been responses and, and around us which studies you're saying that are so let me yeah let me just make a, a, a running list um, spectrum did two studies for for the Massachusetts legislature in 2010 and updated in 2012. Does that sound about right? That generated really the, the notion of three destination resorts, three regions. Ultimately, the, um, the legislature drew the regions different from the first study, and the second study was a bit of an update because of that redraw. Um, The state of Rhode Island did two studies uh, as, as when, when Massachusetts passed uh, uh, um, uh, expanded gaming, uh, they asked their consultant to do uh, an impact assessment based on what they were, uh, they were expecting to see. And that was, uh, they updated their own, um, uh, st that study uh, years later, uh, this, this March, March of 20. 19. I could go into details, but the, the gist of that is that because of the first study, they responded in one way. They actually expanded their one license into to, to include tables. Uh, they moved one license from Newport into Tiverton, and they have expanded sports betting. So the second study then updates and looks back and says, because of all those changes, you are now in a position to not be as impacted 
as we had predicted years before. Um, every applicant made their own studies when, when we opened their, you know, their solicitation of all the regions. Every applicant, not just um, every um, ultimately licensee. And those and have not been updated. Those, well, with the, the Brockton one has been updated um, right. because, because which we, we had the benefit of at least thing, including in the packet, uh, we did not talk about it with Mr. Bloom in, uh, and, and his team in the, in the request for reconsideration. Um, I, uh, another small parenthesis, um, a few of those applicants who ultimately lost the license predicted larger uh, revenues than the people who won. Um, what, what, we, uh, what we did, what our consultants did, was create a framework of um, uh, you know, those, those revenues, a market assessment that was going to allow us to test the reasonability of the applicant's projections. Um, and there's been, uh, you know, uh, a couple of studies done in New York. They are currently um, conducting their own assessment, market assessment, because they have different dynamics over there, but not dissimilar to, to us. Uh, they had three licenses awarded uh, at around the same time that we awarded uh, Region B uh, and are looking to whether they should expand uh, or wait for regions, for um, licenses closer to, closer to Manhattan. Uh, they are currently going through a market assessment um, solicitation. Uh, it, it, is, it is that, it is, it is a, a little bit of that that I wanted just to, that, that's a very rough summary. Um, you know, the findings within those uh, might be benefit to kind of like bring, bring for further discussion. But let me go back to the, to the point I think I made it, that's, that's really that I wanted to conclude this with. And that is that everybody overestimated those um, projections. By the way, there, um, when we awarded the licenses, that was, you know, revenues was only one aspect. Uh, I, I will remind everybody, the public, that you know, the jobs, the host community payments, etc. You know, that that has been uh, uh, yes, for that has for been instance, happened. The capital investment. The capital investment was yes. was uh, yeah. uh, triplicated in one case, duplicated in another, duplicated in the in the category B as well. Um, so I'm I'm just when I'm talking about this is exclusively re revenues, um, but they're an important piece of the business model and um, I currently feel no sense of urgency in terms of and this is where the timing conversation really comes um, if we have not seen you know the levels that the applicants themselves predicted because they did predict certain revenues uh, from from year one uh, and they're not they're not currently seeing those revenues I would rather frankly, see how it goes, do more analysis of their own, um, you know, understand better how they're competing in the market. It's early, in my opinion. Um, I think fundamentally um, that the theme that I glean is that everybody may have overestimated how easy it was going to transfer, get, get uh, a, a new player. Uh, there's there's players that stick around to their um, um, to the to the places that they like, and there's a key of, a key piece of evidence that actually we can see on the other side. Um, when Plainridge uh, predicted they did their own projections, they predicted themselves that the revenues were going to decrease more than what they actually have decreased when the new casinos in Massachusetts came, came into line. But, but they were talking about Regency as well. So that would make sense why it didn't decrease is, as much. Um, Precisely. Right, and but I mean, it, it's so that, that that is still out there, right? That, that one license is still. So I guess we're just trying to decide. I hear what you're saying about um, let's wait, but I, I just have a concern that is that being fair to Regency? Um, and I and think- <coughs> Commissioner Cameron, I think this is gonna be the continuum, and I'm, I'm not, I, 
we need to continue this conversation in depth. But Senator Pacheco would love to give remarks and has a timetable. Can you finish your thought and then and then we'll note it and have him return? Because I think you're saying exactly that's a good segue. He's here sure. on behalf of I'll, Regency. I can, I can see. Would we like the senator to speak now and then I'll continue after? That's what, yeah, because right what you just said is, you know, it's fair to Regency and that might be exactly a good segue for him to make his comments and then we'll continue. And can you? Yes, you've got fine. your notes. Yes, I, I, I hate know exactly to interrupt. what I want to say. Okay, I, I figured you would. Sure. Thank you again. Um, my apologies to my fellow commissioner, but also we wanted to give you that opportunity. No worries. Well, first of all, let me just thank you, Madam Chair, and members of the commission for allowing me to come before you today and and just give you a, a couple of thoughts as you continue your deliberations. Uh, as you go forward, I'd like to just begin by saying that uh, how proud I have been of the work that we did in the legislation uh, in terms of crafting uh, comprehensive gaming legislation for Massachusetts. A big piece of that was the establishment of the Gaming Commission. Uh, in the way the Gaming Commission has thoughtfully moved forward throughout the process and ensured that uh, integrity <coughs> and, uh, uh, you know, those issues that many of us, uh, you know, cared about uh, were protected uh, as in all the decisions uh, that have been made. And so I, I just want you to know at, at the outset of my comments that <clears throat> I have largely supported everything that I've seen the Commission do, uh, you know, relative to uh, all of the, you know, very sometimes difficult decisions that you have to make, in particular with applicants, applications that come in and so on and so forth. But because there were, you know, some new members of the Commission, and because of some of the activity that's going on across the way over in Beacon Hill these days, I, I did want to come here personally and give you a little perspective from Regency. Um, as I stated, the legislature thought very hard about what we should be doing. When we looked at this back in 2010, 2011, uh, you know, by the way, the unemployment rate in Massachusetts back then was around 7.4%, 7.5%, something like that. Today it's 2.9. I think the market's much better today as opposed to where it was, you know, back then. Um, so, but we, we were looking for job creators, ways in which, uh, uh, you know, people in Massachusetts, if they were going to uh, participate in gaming, that they could do so here, so we could capture some of the revenues that were going to be spent anyway. And yes, we'd have a percentage of problems with gambling issues in terms of compulsive gambling. But up to that point in time, we bore all the cost related to compulsive gambling, but we received none of the revenue uh, in terms of casino gaming. Uh, that is starting uh, to change obviously not to the extent that we would like to see but it is it is uh, quite significant an encore uh, you know to over two billion dollar you know close to three billion dollar facility you know 4,800 jobs uh, the, the, the casino in Springfield uh, maybe had a little bit to do with that unemployment rate as well uh, you know heading down to, to the level uh, that it's at today 
So what prompts me here today is because of legislation I'm seeing filed. And some of these developers that are behind the filing of some of these pieces of legislation, uh, you know, don't mind as they go around the state house saying, well, you know, and I don't think the Gaming Commission would have any problem with that at all, and so on and so forth, you know. Now, I know it's not coming from here, but I just want to let you know uh, that that is part and parcel of what happens in terms of lobbying for new legislation. Uh, we crafted the legislation in a way that we would only have three destination-based casinos in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, period. One slot parlor, which happens to be now at Plain Ridge. And of course, we have some simulcasting going on in, uh, in Raynham, have the lottery, uh, you know, et cetera. I don't have to explain to you all the, you know, different aspects of gaming that we have in, in Massachusetts. As somebody who has represented Region C for 31 years now, in the Massachusetts legislature. Four years in the House and the remainder of those years in the Senate. We want to be treated the same as the other two regions, as the legislature said we would. Now, the difference in Region C, as opposed to the other regions, was the Native American, you know, gaming. So the Wampanoag tribe, the uniqueness of the Aquina on the, on, uh, the islands, you know, those pieces, you know, have a lot to do with what happens at the federal level. And so I think it's absolutely quite appropriate that the Gaming Commission get updated, you know, legal analysis uh, relative to what's happening at the federal level. I made a call before I came over to try to figure out what was happening at the federal level. And my sources tell me that we probably won't know too much until the end of the year. And while we may know something definitively by the end of the year, you know, when January 20th turns around of 2020, it is no longer definitive if there's a change in the White House. Because the Department of Interior opinions that at this point in time are coming from the top down, and I mean way up the top down, not the other way around, uh, may change significantly between now and then. So I'm here to ask the Commission to continue with your thoughtful deliberation about everything that is going on and to not make a decision even though it may be in our best interest because it's within your jurisdiction under existing law to go out for a commercial you know casino if the commission chooses to and if i know that there's absolutely no way that a native american casino can come to be in region c I'd be one of the first people here to urge you to do so. But if that still, if that uncertainty still looms out there at any level, it will have a significant effect on those that even bid. Because any of these entities that are going to commit to the level of spending uh, 
that they need to have for a class one license, you know, don't want to risk having a Native American casino opening up next door under federal statute. That you'd actually have nothing to do with in terms of being able to stop it if the land and trust issues were to go forward. So that's my concern. Now, as far as the market analysis is concerned, you can take all the market analysis studies that have been done, you know, in uh, it's sort of like those that are in my generation, remember Johnny Carson with the envelope to his head, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, you can, you can do all of that stuff. And I, I just want to say this. The only way you really know what's going to happen in a region is when you put it out to bid. I get a feeling that Genting didn't spend $500 million of their money to try to, you know, uh, be a partner with the Wampanoag tribe, you know, to figure they wouldn't be getting that money back. Uh, you know, what we would be doing in Region C when there is a casino in Region C, and I hope very much that there will be a casino in Region C, is we will be taking some of our money back from Rhode Island coming back into Massachusetts. We'll be taking some of our money back from Connecticut and bringing it back to Massachusetts. And we'll have an excellent location wherever that is to market destination-based tra travel very close to Cape Cod for all the parts of the year except for maybe one season. So there's a tremendous opportunity for uh, travel and tourism and economic development in southeastern Massachusetts. And I just want to conclude by saying we in southeastern Massachusetts deserve the same level of commitment that the other two regions received. And uh, so I would urge if there's any interest in people coming over here to get the Gaming Commission to change the existing law, I would urge you to say, no way. Not now. Not till we know what's happening in the future. Because there's bills that are filed in my own district. It's not that I'm against having additional gaming. I'm not one of these people that's anti-gaming. I'll, you know, we can have we can have more gaming, but let us implement the vision that we passed first. Let's get that done, up and running, and then assess what's happening. The legislature may be coming back later on this year with, or, or the beginning of next year, uh, with sports betting. That's a whole other issue uh, that you're talking about. It doesn't necessarily impact uh, the casinos, you know, directly, but it's an indirect, Im you know, impact. Uh, so that's what that's what I'm here for. I was just very frustrated with the amount of new legislation that's filed, generated by people who have a self, very very clear self-interest in seeing their own proposals adopted. Uh, with their own market analysis, and Commissioner, I agree with you, that usually is tainted towards what the developer that's proposing uh, the development wants to see. Because they should, certainly wouldn't be coming forward to the legislature or anyone else if it didn't agree with what they wanted. You know? mm -hmm. uh, again, the only way you're going to know what the market is in Region C at the end of the day is when you put something out to bid mm -hmm. and to find out who's going to bid on it. And if they're not going to make as much money as they may have thought, but they're still making a profit, 
and we still have the jobs, and we still have the building, and we have the economic development, so be it. That's competition. We shouldn't be, uh, you know, trying to predetermine what that com competition will will bring. And I just know one thing: I, I represent Taunton, I represent Wayham, represent all the communities in between down the 495 belt. I have thousands and thousands of my constituents every day that just head in a slightly different direction. And they're in Rhode Island casinos, in Connecticut casinos, going to see the shows, going to uh, there for entertainment purposes, not just gaming. Thousands and thousands of people every day. We want to bring those people back to Massachusetts. So thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator. If I might just say, Senator, um, we are very respectful of the role of, of the legislature, and that is not our role, and we do not ever, I've been doing, you know, seven and a half years, we have never once presumed to, to say this project's better than the other. We really do respect the role of the re legislature, and anyone that comes to us, and they do, with a project, um, we listen and say, you know, Thank you for letting us know, but certainly that's the responsibility of the legislature to make decisions on uh, any kind of a change in the law or whatnot. So I think we're just trying to figure out as a commission where, what, what we want to do when we're asked about Region C, what is the best course of action right now at the time, so we, we don't presume anything. So thank you for coming, though. It's, it's important information. Senator, I would, I would just add, if I could, um, First of all, thank you for taking the time to come down here. I was at a workforce summit meeting yesterday, and I understand from the Senate president that uh, you have a lot of other topics on the agenda this week and, uh, and ahead. Um, and uh, and as, as one commissioner, and I think my colleagues would agree, uh, just to reflect on your point about uh, uh, the original gaming statute being very well thought out, um, we hear that from other jurisdictions. Um, we certainly uh, uh, are pleased to know that you gave us a pretty good roadmap, a great roadmap to follow in terms of what you envision the process to be, and we've we've all followed that to the to the best of our ability. Um, you did bring up the the issue of sports betting. Obviously, our licensees have been very vocal about their interest in seeing sports betting. Uh, is we've talked about a potential market study uh, for our benefit. Um, would it be helpful, do you think, in your opinion, to have us assess the market for sports betting as it might pertain to revenues generated for the Commonwealth, if that would be helpful to you and your colleagues? It certainly wouldn't hurt. To, the, the more information that legislature receives on all these issues, the better, the better it is. But I think uh, we all can conclude, based upon what we're seeing happen with other jurisdictions, that we will uh, uh, see some significant revenue generated. You know, how much would determine, uh, uh, look at some of the, uh, you know, analysis that's being done, and certainly we would welcome. I mean, at least I would welcome. I can't speak for the whole legislature, but. I'm, you know, this individual legislator would certainly welcome any of the uh, additional information that you can provide. And we're very careful, uh, Senator, that we understand there are just proposals uh, that are pending uh, with respect to sports betting, and we understand that the role, if there were to be legalized sports betting, if there's a regulator that it's not decided as well. But should we move forward on some kind of analysis where the implications of sports betting for the future would be helpful, then um, we would be glad to do the again to echo uh, Commissioner Cameron. We never make any presumptions. Thank you, Senator, for uh, for your remarks. I think uh, you you summarize well a lot of the arc, and I think it bears, um, if I if I may, also uh, go back a little bit to. Um, 
you know, from our perspective, what, what we wrestled with that you, uh, that you alluded to. Um, I, I, um, I also think the legislature was really well thought through and crafted, and I think, uh, you know, a lot of it we have been fortunate enough to see in real time. Um, and um, when it came to Region C, um, it did provide these at least temporary advantage for the tribe in terms of timing, which is how we found ourselves, of course, bidding the, 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 the way we did. It was in many ways prescribed. We, we had to go with mm -hmm. Category 2 first, uh, and then the other regions. Um, I remember at the time, and you have testified before us as well, uh, um, uh, you know, in hearings that we conducted in the region, that, as you allude, the, the specter of the tribe uh, was a big factor in the response or seemingly lack of interest that we received at, in that region at the time. In that case, it was only uh, the Brockton proposal. And even at that time, uh, when we did have, uh, you know, that market study, uh, and uh, you know the one that they proposed and the one from our all consultants, uh, there was quite a bit of uh, judgment call, uh, uh, if you will, uh, because uh, the dynamics of the market, you know, are hard to predict. Who knows how much is one place going to take away from another, and that changes the, the dynamic quite a bit. The, the point of, of, of me just, just saying this is that just looking back, it's easier to do the first decision that was sort of in terms of timing. It's needless to say a lot harder to make the fourth decision, and that is where we where we find ourselves um, with with this region for all for all reasons that were not necessarily the fault of anybody here. Um, and um, I, I will I will also add my. Um, uh, my comments relative to we you know we don't endorse any kind of bills that come that make their way. Uh, it's not surprising that people might want to say that that in, in, implicitly that that we have or, or not. Um, I, I see ourselves perhaps in a better position um, to provide the information that as we see it, even though a lot of it ultimately relies on um, you know the projections of some, uh, and you know they're going to come with their own. Um, uh, you know, with their own background. Um, so I, I think that, um, um, like you, everybody uh, here wants to see the best for, not, not, not treat any other region differently. Um, I think more than anything else, it's the, the particular dynamics for, to this region, still the possibility of the MASHP, as you correctly point out, um, perhaps, you know, with with different um, updates that the last time we, we looked at this, but also because of the timing <clears throat> that we find ourselves now with uh, the ability or not uh, to decide on the timing on, on whether to, uh, you know, to uh, approve a, a, a commercial license or bid a commercial license. I agree with you, by the way, that ultimately the best indicator is whether there is uh, a bidder or not on any, any of this, ultimately. Mm -hmm. And we do seem to have one, um, one that wanted reconsideration uh, uh, recently, which we, as, as, as you know, uh, we decided, we declined on. Um, what I think we find ourselves in is trying to have these competing interests relative to those benefits for Region C and the inherent impact that that would bring, not only because of a potential still with the tribe, but what may be of the existing licenses that we now have. Yeah, well, I, well, I thank you very much. And let me, uh, I've got to run over uh, because session's going to start at any moment now. But I, I do want to, you know, really, Madam Chair, thank you. And, and I want to thank all of you for uh, giving me the courtesy to come in and, and talk to you about this. It just, uh, for me, representing the region, and then seeing proposals coming in in the region and assertions being made publicly that uh, the market doesn't work any longer in Regency for a destination-based casino from somebody that's looking to get 
you know, uh, their own deal done, it, it just frustrated me enough to make sure that the folks that are in charge of Regency, uh, you know, in terms of all of, all of you, could hear from somebody in Regency that I wouldn't have any problem if you decided to go out for commercial, but not to uh, ask the legislature, you know, to change the law to downsize what that uh, that uh, the type of model uh, that we'd be looking for in Regency it should be the same as A and B, not anything less. We don't want anything less than that in uh, southeastern Massachusetts and. And some of the bids that you had received, I think the commission correctly uh, uh, came down on the side that you know they weren't, you know, significant enough for what you know, you, you needed to have to be a true, you know, destination-based casino model uh, for Regency, because that is uh, the type of uh, proposal when you have those that actually brings in patrons from out of state, from out of the country, uh, a destination-based casino. And we will take back a lot of the revenue from Rhode Island and Connecticut when that happens. And I say when it happens, not if it happens. I think it will happen in the future, that you'll eventually get to a day when you have all the information and then a decision you know, it gets made. I'm not. I'm just not sure that day is today. Uh, you know, because we don't know what's happening with lit litigation. And quite frankly, I think uh, federal, uh, the federal view on a lot of the regulatory provisions, you know, may change significantly across the entire government, not just the Department of Interior, if there is a change uh, in the White House on the 20th of January. So we'll see. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. And now, Commissioner Cameron, right. I am so, sorry for no, the interruption, but I, I, I thought it might be. It's important be. to let the Senator speak. Not thank problem. you very Not much. Problem. So, no, the point I was making was, um, you know, information is critical to us. I would not be comfortable moving forward saying, let's open Regency uh, because we have a request to do so without, um, without more information. So we have one suggestion, which I think is a very good one, to have uh, an update on uh, uh, the tribe's progress here, or, or just everyone's best uh, um, professional idea of where they are now and what the challenges are and what the time frame is and um, so that that's an important update we haven't had one in several years um, the other piece is um, you know I mentioned the market analysis but I, I request for information is is really good too because frankly we don't have all the answers right and listening to others is a critical piece and I think that would be if that informs us to, as to whether or not the market analysis is it an effective next step? I'm very happy to go along with that. I think those pieces would be important before we did any hearings because people like to be informed as well. Mm -hmm. So before they opine on what's best for their region. So I think this information is really important to us, but really important to the public as well. Well, I have a couple of questions that I could include in the RFI, but I think I don't, you know, that I think it's important that we think of them broadly and not necessarily off the cuff today. But um, right. um, I, you know, um, I think ultimately it's 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 a good, you know, step to take to continue to assess the situation. It's not really at odds with what I was perhaps advocating earlier a little bit, saying, you know, we need to wait and see. Some of this information could also come from additional um, market studies that our own licensees either conduct or commission or um, some of the results, you know, begin to change one way or another. Um, so I, I, I think if we, if we you know, um, aggregated some of the information that's already available, started to ask questions before, uh, let's say, uh, 
a market assessment, that could be a good way to, yeah. to I'm continue. A, I'm imagining forward. that uh, the executive director is going to say that they would be assisting in the process if we went the direction. You, you are looking for general direction today. I, I think I've gotten some. So I would suggest, um, Chair, that the next steps would be that we come back with a definitive litigation update and legis mm -hmm. federal legislation update. Mm -hmm. And we also come back with a potential draft RFI, which would include in some, some of the questions the commissioners have concerns about. So you could do two things. A, you could be informed on the legislative slash uh, litigation update. And then um, in the next sitting, we could maybe formalize uh, what an RFI looks like. Or maybe you see it and say, uh, you know, you're, it is not what you expected, but it's easier to look at something, I think, on paper. Before we move to an exact direction, I want to just check in. I liked what Commissioner Cameron said, that the public would benefit from that information as well. But we do have, of course, the option of sure. doing even um, a first step of, of soliciting yep. public comments, either in, in you know, person or by paper, email. Um, or do it as I think you suggested, maybe holding on that. Commissioner I, I, Bryant. I don't think um, you could also get comments, public comment on the RFI in terms of what people think is relevant. And I think if you do an overview of the legislative status, you potentially also do an overview of the other studies that are out there, not necessarily limited to the Commonwealth. That may guide not only our conversation, but an opportunity for public comment on an RFI. Um, and not to belabor the point, but to make clear where I stand on, and I said this repeatedly the last time we talked about Regency in terms of market analysis, um, I think it's critical we did our own. I don't want to rely on someone else's. But I am in alignment with um, Commissioner Zuniga. I do think with the changes in what's been open in the last 18 months in the Commonwealth, I'm not convinced now is the time. So I'm comfortable with the compilation of the legislative status as well as looking at the drafting of an RFI, and that's about as far as I'm comfortable with right now. I would just want to add to that, um, you know, I, I, and again, maybe this gets into the dirty details of the RFI, um, but my hope would be that that RFI would be written in such a way that some of your response to it isn't necessarily eliminated from doing future work. Yeah. I understand there are guidelines, procurement guidelines around that, but yeah, I would like some I'm answer gonna, that, to that. Yeah, it's a really good point. Admittedly, I'll need some legal help on that. I want to make sure we don't stumble okay. into that uh, yeah. potential. And if, and if it truly is a barrier, we need to be very, very clear okay. on that. All right. Well, that'll be a condition precedent. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, the other point I want to make is um, in getting a, a legal analysis of um, law cases surrounding the, the, the tribe and the Department of Interior's decisions. Uh, I assume we are giving him, the executive director, the ability to use some funds if we need to go out and get technical assistance. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Let me take one step at a time. We will get, like, the facts and then see in terms of, I think, interpretations and opinions on outcomes. Boy, these are tricky. <laughs> No, I think we're really asking for a, a real legal analysis okay. of of where we are right now, because it's been dynamic. I think we can all admit. Yeah. yeah. Um, but because of the complexities of the legal analysis, you you in the legal department may say, right. we think we've got it, but we want to do a, yeah, the tribal, a, a double check. Uh, it, and there's no there's no problem with saying let's get a, a you know yeah. another sure. set of eyes. Um, I, I think we, that, that you don't need affirmative authorization no, I, on that. I, no, I could do that. Thank you, though, for that. It's yeah. guidance. That's helpful. Thank you. And, and, I, and again, I think because there's been federal legislation, just to include that update, that we would be will. separate and apart from the uh, two court uh, proceedings. So and do we have a consensus that at this time, in <clears throat> no public hearings um, and uh, we'll just right now ask for the federal update on the tribal issue and a draft RFI, which we understand it will be a draft. I wouldn't be surprised mm -hmm. if we've got to do a, quite a bit of work on it mm -hmm. uh, because it is a, a different approach. With the understanding that a respondent 
would not be precluded from a potential RFR RFP. I think, yeah, to the extent that that's permissible. Right. right. If we can allow that. Yeah. Thank you. Anything further that we want to give guidance on this matter? I think. If, if I can just add one more thing, you know, in our um, in our packet, and I know all of us saw this. Uh, not only did we have a, a letter from uh, from Goodwin, the representatives from MG&E, uh, in regard to this issue, but we also had uh, what I know we were given samples, but over uh, 300 messages I counted of uh, from folks who were. Uh, opposed to the proposal down in Brockton um, as part of our packet. I know we've also seen a, a passionate letter from the mayor. We've also heard testimony from the state senator. Um, you know, I don't want it to go unnoticed. I don't think it has that Brockton is a gateway city and it is a city that has continued to be anxious to find economic development opportunities to turn around their pride city and offer new employment opportunities for their residents. Um, and I think we've heard that from both opponents and proponents of gaming as we've, as we've listened to the folks in Brockton. Um, I've lived and worked in the Gateway City. I understand that, that drive and ambition. Um, um, somewhere in the back burner, I think it'd be great if we uh, remained open uh, somehow to a possible role we might play with that that challenge before the city of Brockton. I don't know what shape it takes, but I would just like us to be mindful of that uh, of that situation for the city. And as a reminder, at the um, proceeding at which um, Mr. Bloom and his lawyers presented their motion for reconsideration. We didn't include those comments because we viewed they were outside the scope of that proceeding. However, at that proceeding, uh, the mayor, again as an elected official, was able to offer mm -hmm. his insights on exactly those challenges that you uh, recognize, uh, Commissioner Stebbins. Today we did include them to, to really um, provide a little glimpse of balance as to both the um, <clears throat> the Goodman Proctor um, letter and their request and the fact that we have in fact received uh, a significant public comment uh, which might suggest less support than what they were advocating for. So again, it doesn't sound like we're going to solicit further uh, public comment at this juncture or uh, go for public hearing because I think we recognize that more information will be helpful for not only us, but for the public. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. Very well. Thank you. All right. So that concludes uh, your report under Commission Matters uh, Item 6, um, Ed. And we do have our placeholder for Commission Updates. If we could hold off on any Commissioner Updates in the interest of time and provide them in um, at our next meeting, which will be in Plainridge, um, Plainville, I'm sorry, oh, that's right. It won't be at the casino. It'll be in, at the Plainville uh, Public uh, Safety Facility. Um, then we'll move on to um, <clears throat> items number eight, nine, and 10, because we have moved item number seven to, our, to another session, most likely our most next immediate session. And with that, um, items 8, 9, and 10 are executive sessions, are contemplated for executive sessions. If we so vote for item 8, the Commission will go into executive session pursuant to Mass General Laws, Chapter 30A, Section 21A, Subsection 3, for the purpose of discussing strategy with respect to collective bargaining as discussion at an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the commission. Do I have a motion to go into executive session for that purpose? So moved. And I second that motion. Second, thank you. And as you understand, an executive session requires a roll call vote. Commissioner Stebbins, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner Zuniga? Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Cameron? Aye. 
and the chair votes yes. Moving on to item number nine. If you so vote, the commission will go into executive session in accordance with Mass General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 21A, Subsection 3, for the purpose of discussing strategy with respect to the ongoing Region A litigation, as discussion at an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigation position of the commission. Do I have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Moved and seconded. This item, as you know, requires a roll call vote. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. And Commissioner Cameron. Aye. And the chair votes yes. As to item 10, uh, consistent with my past recusal, I will be recusing myself from this particular fine, um, executive session, and I have asked Commissioner Cameron to chair that session. Uh, if uh, in accordance with um, uh, Chapter 30A, this executive section, Section 21A3, for the purpose of discussing uh, strategy with respect to ongoing Region A litigation, uh, and this is a discussion um, at an open meeting, may have a detrimental effect on litigating the litigating position of the Commission. Um, do I have a motion to go into executive session? Uh, so moved. A second? Second. Again, this requires a roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Stebbins? Aye. Commissioner Zuniga? Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. And I, Commissioner Cameron, uh, vote aye as well. And my recusal. Uh, and uh, the chair has just uh, mentioned that she's recusing from this item and um, make note of that. Great. Before we um, um, go into executive session, item 11 does um, uh, ask if there's any business not reasonably anticipated at the time of posting. I think we're all set. So <clears throat> the commission will be now in executive session. The public session of the commission meeting will not reconvene at the conclusion of the executive sessions. All members of the public and any staff members not involved in the matter to be discussed must leave the room and the doors to the room will be closed. We thank uh, all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.